Russian nuclear physicist, um, a British banker, you were the British banker, uh, an American race car driver, a Mexican hooker, um, a French poet, an Italian priest. <sighs> oh no, it was a German race car driver because it was an American supermodel and a Swedish chef. And by the midpoint of that show, the accents were just moving back and forth rapidly between the characters. And everyone kind of wound up sounding like pirates or vampires by the end. <laughs> Okay, so it looks like we do have Oliver. Yay! Um, I've renamed him as Tristan Sara. I don't know if he can hear us, but uh, Tristan, we can see that you're here. We've let you in. Uh, there's yes. four people waiting. Now, are we saying the... Zar or are we saying Zara? Zara. 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 Okay. Yeah, there's Why an A on the Zara? end of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the mask of Zara. Yeah. Who's talking yeah. to me? Yep. Uh, it's uh, Zara. Uh, Hi, there's Tristan. another. Uh, hello. There's another uh, me. There's another Oliver coming in from a different device. Are you able to look at that person? In? Oliver, too. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. This allows me to see everyone on my computer because I do not have a camera on my computer. Okay. So, there Oliver we go. Two. Okay, oh, there wow. we go. Cool. All right. Gotcha. Maybe Oliver should be on video. I can't find my monocle though, so sorry. <laughs> yeah, sadly I don't have round glasses. Yeah, I had this idea that when I was playing old car, I would have my glasses on, and then for young car I would have my glasses off until I realized, but I can't actually read the script. You can't can't read the script. <laughs> yep, yep. Welcome to middle age. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to hide oh goodness! There we go. Um, okay. I wish I could have got a fancy countdown clock for you. I'm sorry I don't have one, but I did DJ give you permission to record, so you should yeah. be able to do that. Yeah, I've started recording. Okay, good. So all, all the pre-show banter. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I've got my drink next to me too. I've got, I've got my, uh, I've got my stage crew. And they're all in their blacks as well, <laughs> but uh, they're they're on a man union break, so I can't I can't get them to do anything right now. I have Tristan Zara's library card. Oh, nice! I have the uh, lawsuit against James Joyce <laughs> and the book by Lennon. I have some lighting for when I'm a stripper. Yay! I got your music, so we'll see how that goes. Wait, what? <laughs> uh, Deej, I, yep. I do have a preliminary question. Yeah? Yep. So I got like uh, envelopes. It says uh, in when he first comes in that he's uh, kind of a Romanian non- nonsense kind of thing and it says that he comes in normally later uh is that act two is oh no 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 it's right after because you know the scenes keep repeating that scene repeats like three times and so it's just the first time when is when is even the the writing is written plays here plays here right what else um so it's just that very first entrance is like wildly over the top and then after that he's like real zara for the rest of it. Gotcha. I guess I just didn't see where the scenes repeat. Because um, that one goes through in Limerick. Gotcha. That, that one starts and then he enters, and then Joyce enters and everyone speaks in Limerick through the rest of that scene. And then it jumps back. Uh, yeah, I, just the point where it jumps back are not clear to me, but that's fine. I'll, uh, let, give me a second.
And Tim, are you doing like a, the only people that are seen in the room are the people who are speaking or are we just seen the entire time? I would love to do that, but that is a, that is a setting. So what I'm going to ask okay. you, you as actors to do is if you're not in the scene, use your own setting to just hit video. If you don't hit it fast enough, I, I can help with that as the host. I can go in and do that. Um, and we're going to be asking the audience as well to use the uh, hide all non-video participants. So that okay. way we'll only see the people who are acting in our quote unquote in the scene. Um, whether they actually do that or not, I don't know. So if you're not, if you don't have any lines in a particular scene, just hide your video, mute your mic and uh, bring yourself back. Okay. Oh, I'll be gone for 90% of the play. <laughs> you will. <laughs> yeah. They'll never see me, so I'm okay, yeah, yeah. Now if I press stop video, will that also stop recording? No. Okay. No. You actually have to hit the record button to, to guess, stop that. Stop I guess video all... just, Made you disappear, DJ. You turned into, yeah, uh, yeah, just yeah. I just it. tested it, yeah, and it, and it kept saying recording. Talk, so, yeah. you say stop video. Don't like think you're like backstage. <laughs> we'll be able to hear you still. And yeah, so you got to you got to stop. You got to hit your mic if you're going to do like you know bodily functions or whatever. Otherwise, yeah, we're going to hear everything in the background. And Oliver, you can hear me. Uh, you actually exit the stage. Um, the, I think Marcel has the last line. Say is say give my regards to your auntie, um, and then Joyce does a couple of limericks on his own. Uh, uh, when I want to leave things in the air, I say, "Excuse me, I've got to repair to my book about bloom," and then just leave the room. Then I say to resume, Zarek, my one who was there, ending the limerick, and it's so that's the end of that bit. But I don't know if you heard it, anything I said. Yeah, we heard you. Yeah, but I don't know if Oliver did because his volume's off. And we um, just see the picture of him in pain. Sorry, what do you say? Yeah, the mic might be off, but we can hear everything you're saying. Um, okay. I would like to, I'm just going to pop something in the chat right now for everyone. Um, I'm just going to send this message to our audience first. Okay. And then I'm going to talk to all of you. And. Um, I'm going to give you my uh, cell phone number so that if you run into any technical glitches okay. during anywhere, you can text me right away and just say, hey, this is what's going on. And if we need to, just be aware it's Zoom. Technical glitches will occur. Yep. That's it's, just, great. it's just the nature of the medium. Don't panic. Everything will be okay. So uh, here it is. Here. DJ, don't you panic. Not okay. I should actually be playing Karl Marx with this beard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, Sam just wanted me to go over it. So down in the left-hand corner, there's a, an icon with a video camera. It says, stop video. Don't do that. But there's a little arrow pointing up. If you click on that. It says video settings. And if you click on video settings, down in meetings, there's, there's a, a little tick box that says, hide non-video participants and that's the one you want to click so that anybody who turns off their video disappears effectively from your screen i'm on my phone and i don't see that anywhere and it won't apply to you um, my experience with people who are on their phones emily what happens is you can only see who's speaking at any given time is that right yeah and then yeah everyone that's else just a, a limitation of the medium. Everyone else kind of has a grid view. Yeah. Okay, we're about three minutes away from letting in um, our participants. So I'm gonna do the, oh, DJ, we are gonna have like an intermission, right? Yeah. Cause yeah, like that, 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 that first act is like 44 pages, yeah. which calculates out to being about 60 minutes long. You're gonna have a snack lobby experience. Yeah, minute so per page. Just, yeah, so we're just, yeah. I wish it was a minute per page. It's usually <laughs> mid. Mm. So uh, yeah. So uh, I'm I'm gonna suggest that uh, we have a like 10 minute bio break, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Play something in the background, and then uh, we'll just come back to it. So absolutely. Enough. Okay, yeah, so I'm gonna take go a quick one now because I am my age, and I'll be right back. Yeah, fortunately, the second act is much faster than the first act. Yeah. All good plays. 
and and I and I'm I I've been really working on getting the script down so that my 20 page monologue at the top of the play will not take 20 minutes. <laughs> it's such Some a damn text in here. <laughs> oh, so so wait when we, yeah it, it is weirdly indulgent. Um, so when we're off stage, we like turn our video off, right? We exit. Yeah. yeah okay. Cool. Although, yeah, and, otherwise it'd be weird. We're just hanging. And your sound. Like an improv set. We're just hanging. <laughs> mm. I should trim this back a bit. So is that natural, or have you your mustache all over? It is, isn't it? You got it just perfect yeah. through the period. Uh, I I looked at the pictures and he never had a mustache, but I figured the uh, clean cut would be enough. So, oh yeah, it looks totally it looks totally right. Oh, I didn't know I had to be authentic for this. I should have. Oh, good God! Yeah, like I yeah I'm. <laughs> I I should have uh, I should have uh, been been a communist. Uh, You're the exact right dress. <laughs> With the headphones? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Nothing I can do about that. During the entire weekend. Yeah. I'm also not going to do this weird kind of too proper British accent because uh, it's going to make everything that I say real boring. So <laughs> uh, deal with that. Yeah, there you go. Get a, an American Tristan Zara. At least you, I don't think you've got any horrible, do you say any like German words or Russian words in the, in the start, in the script? I've got a few. Uh, I say Romanian words. Okay. There you go. Yeah. And we're all going to choke over these. <laughs> That's fine. I'm just doing a French accent with a little bit of Dracula. And that'll nice. Be it. Nice. <laughs> Perfect. Well, that's accurate. Stracula's castles in Romania. I I have no idea how to pronounce Dishil Holes Imus. It, like I, I pronounce it like Latin. Oh, I think it is. Yeah. Okay, I'll pronounce it like Latin. Then. <laughs> Cast in a spell. <laughs> Cast in a spell. Spell it in chat, and I'll have a look at it. What language is it supposed to be? I don't. It, that's right at the beginning, when Joyce is um. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. When, yeah, that opening scene where you hear Lenin and you hear Joyce and and Zara is doing the poem, and it's all it's all just mysterious because you don't understand anything that anyone is saying in that in that whole first segment. Yeah, I just found it. Yeah, it's Latin. It'll be good. Yeah, I wasn't able to translate it to anything though. He has, there's another play that Stopper does where he does a similar thing at the opening where you, you think you understand the words that people are saying, but the words all turn out to have other meanings. So you think you're following it and then you find out that nothing actually means what you think it means and it's all different. Things like block, cube, square, or something like that. So it seems, is very simple. None of the words actually. And then have Joyce that. has German words interspersed with English words on the next page. It's like, well, aren't you going to be doing aerobics? <laughs> uh, okay, it's uh, seven thirty-two. We're ready to get the show on the road. Yep. Okay. Are you going to introduce us, or should we all go off stage, or what? Um, you, you know, know what? what? There's an echo. There's five, five people. people. Sam. Yep. There's five people waiting, so we'll let them in. Uh, I'll talk to them, walk, walk them through the uh, instructions as such, and, um, and then I will read the opening part of the play, and, and we're off to the races. Sound all right? All right. Okay. Here we go. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Travesties. I see everybody got the message about turning off your mics and video cameras. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, we're going to introduce all the actors at the end of the play. 
because uh, we don't have a playbill for you to look at at this point. They are, however, all correctly named, so they are named as their characters for the moment. And uh, you won't be hearing much from me. I'm Tim Webster, your stage manager, and I'll be providing the, the set decoration for you as such. And uh, we would like to now perform, um, we would now like to perform Tom Stoppard's travesties for you and uh, hope that you enjoy it. I just need to remind you to uh, hit that setting that says to hide non-video participants in your uh, video settings. And uh, we'll begin in just a moment. Okay. Almost ready. Stop. Okay. Turn off the chat. Turn off. We begin in the library. Gwen sits with Joyce. They are occupied with books, papers, and pencils. Lennon is also writing quietly among books and papers. Tsara is writing as the play begins. On his table are a hat and a large pair of scissors. Zara finishes writing, then takes up the scissors and cuts the paper word by word into his hat. When all the words are in the hat, he shakes the hat and empties it on the table. He rapidly separates the bits of paper into random lines, turning a few over, and then reads the result in a loud voice. Il ate enormous apple zara, ki deri chef's hat, he'll learn umpara. Il raised a last whispers, kill later not eat, noon avuncular il de clara. Deshil Holes Imus. Deshil Holes Imus. Price. Mm -hmm. Send us bright one, light one, whore horn, quickening, and womb fruit. Send us bright one, light one, whore horn, quickening, and womb fruit. Thrice. Mm hmm. Hoopsa Buha Hoi Hoopsa. Hoopsa Boya Boy Hoopsa. Hoopsa, boy, boy, hoopsa. Likewise, thrice. Mm -hmm. By this time, Zara has replaced the bits of paper into the hat. He takes out a handful and reads the words out one at a time, placing them into the hat as he reads each one. Clara Avuncular. Whispers il umpara. Il not dairy day. Apple Zara. Hat. Cecily has come in with a few books, which she places by Lennon. Zara leaves the library through the door. Gwen has received from Joyce a folder. Cecily receives an identical folder from Lennon. These folders, assumed to contain manuscripts, are eye-catching objects in some striking color. Each girl has cause to place her folder down on a table or chair, and each girl then picks up the wrong folder. Gwen is now ready to leave the library and does so, taking Lennon's folder with her. Cecily also leaves. Nadia enters as Gwen leaves. They bump into each other and each apologizes. Gwen in English, Nadia in Russian. Prostetia. Flotia. 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 Tronsky. Stotokoya. Tronsky, Pishol. On the car stove for Spedisburg Revolutia. Revolutia. At this point, 
Joy stands up and begins to walk up and down, searching his pockets for tiny scraps of paper on which he has previously written down things he may wish to use. While the Lennons continue their conversation, Joyce fishes out one by one these scraps of paper and reads out what he finds on them. Morose delectation, Aquinas, Tunbelly, Freight, Corscapino. He decides he doesn't need this one, screws it up, throws it away, finds a second. Und alle Schiffe brücken. He decides to keep this one as well. Enter weather transubstantiality, odor consubstantiality, but in no way sub substantiality. He decides to keep this one as well. What could the unknown again yet? Navisano Vegetach, on Govrich Dodza, Sobrietia, Ostretia, Pistola. Stoy. Da. Ito Pazak, Ito Pigazatak. Da, da. Idium the moi, on sitot. And Tom? Da. Gazatak Unieva? Da. Tai summa vidiella. Da, da, da. Joyce now encounters a further scrap of paper which is lying on the floor. Lennon has inadvertently dropped it. Joyce picks up this paper. Nadia is leaving the library through the door. Lenin is gathering his papers. Joyce is examining the dropped paper. I uh, can't hear. Oh. Yeah. Little, capitalist, lackeys of imperialism. Lenin recognizes these words. He pauses and approaches Joyce. But on is. Scrutagon, scusi, excuse me. Je vous en prie, vite, prego. It's perfectly all right. Uh, Lennon leaves, Joyce is alone now. A librarianess of Zurich only emerged from her niche with a knack of response to Nick Reden, silence, obliged her to utter the plea. Joyce accedes to her request, puts on his hat, picks up his stick, and while she regards him with disapproval, he leaves at a strolling pace, singing. If you ever go across the sea to Ireland, it may be at the closing of the day. You can sit and watch the moon rise over Cladach and watch the sun go down on Galway Bay. He was Irish, of course, though not actually from Limerick. He was a Dublin man, Joyce. Everyone knows that, couldn't have written the book without it. There was a young man from Dublin, tum ti tum troublin mo. I used to have quite a knack for it. But there's little encouragement for that sort of thing in the consular service. Not a great patron of poetry, the service. Didn't push it, never made a feature of it. I mean, you'd never say that the facility for rhyme and meter was the sine qua non of advancement in the consular service. <laughs> or didn't discourage it, I'm not saying that. On the contrary, a most enlightened and cultivated body of men, fully sympathetic to all the arts. Look no further than the occasion that brought us together, me and Joyce, brought him to this room, full support, a theatrical event of the first water, great success, personal triumph in the demanding role of Ernest. No, no, not Ernest, the other one. In at the top, have we got the cucumber sandwiches for Lady Bracknell? Yeah. Notwithstanding the unfortunate consequences, Irish lout, 
Not one to bear a grudge, however. No, not after all these years and him dead in the cemetery up the hill. No hard feelings either side. Unpleasant as it is to be dragged through the courts for a few francs, though it wasn't the money or the trousers for that matter. But be that as it may, all in all, truth be told, is the encouragement of poetry was not the primary concern of the British consulate in Zurich in 1917, and now I've lost my knack for it. Too late to go back for it. Alas, and alack for it. Uh, <laughs> but I digress. No apologies required. Constant digression being the saving grace of senile reminiscence. <laughs> my memoirs, is it then? Yes. Life and times. Friend of the famous. Memories of James Joyce. The James Joyce I knew. Through the courts with James Joyce. What was he like, James Joyce, I am often asked. It is true that I knew him well at the height of his powers, his genius in full flood in the making of Ulysses before publication and fame turned him into a public monument for pilgrim cameras, more often than not in a velvet smoking jacket of an unknown color, photography being a black and white affair in those days, but probably real blue, if not empirical purple, and sniffing a bunch of sultry violets that positively defy development don't go on. Do it in my head. Mm -hmm. Caviar for the general public. Now then, memories of James Joyce is coming. To those of us who knew him, Joyce's genius was never in doubt. To be in his presence was to be aware of an amazing intellect bent on shaping itself into the permanent form of its own monument, the book the world now knows as Ulysses though at that time we were still calling it, I hope memory serves, by its original title, Elasticated Bloomers. A prudish, prudent man, Joyce, in no way profligate or vulgar, and yet convivial without being spendthrift, and yet without primness towards hard currency in all its transmutable and transferable forms and denominations, of which, however, he demanded only a sufficiency from the world at large, exhibiting a monkish unconcern for worldly and bodily comforts without, at the same time, shutting himself off from the richness of human society whose temptations, on the other hand, he met with an ascetic disregard, tempered only by sudden and catastrophic aberrations. In short, a complex personality, an enigma, a contradictory spokesman for the truth, an obsessive litigant, and yet an essentially private man who wished his total indifference to public notice to be universally recognized. In short, a liar and a hypocrite, a tight-fisted, sponging, fornicating drunk, not worth the paper. <laughs> That's that bit tight. Further recollections of a consular official in whitest Switzerland the ups and downs of consular life in Zurich during the Great War. A sketch. Twas in the bustling metropolis of swiftly guiding trams and grey stone banking houses, of cosmopolitan restaurants on the great stone banks of the swiftly gliding, snot green, mucus meat, tendus limit river, of jeweled escarpments and refugees of all kinds, e.g., Lenin. Mm, there's a point. Lenin as I knew him, the Lenin I knew, halfway to the Finland station with V.I. Lenin, a sketch. I well remember the first time I met Lenin, <laughs> or as he was known on his library ticket, Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov. To be in his presence was to be aware of a, a, a complex personality. Enigmatic, magnetic, but not, I think, astigmatic, his piercing brown, if memory serves, eyes, giving no hint of it. An essentially simple man, and yet an intellectual theoretician, bent, as I was already aware, on the seemingly impossible task of reshaping the civilized world into a federation of standing committees of workers' deputies. As I shook the hand of this dynamic, gnomic, and yet not, I think, anemic stranger, who with his fine head of blonde hair falling over his forehead had the clean-shaven look of a Scandinavian seafaring. Hello, hello, got the wrong chap, has he? 
take no notice. It'll all come out in the wash. That's the art of it. Fact of the matter, who, without benefit of historical perspective in a photograph album, red square packed to the corner, stickers with camaraderie. And now for our main speaker, balding, bearded in a three-piece suit. Good God, if it isn't Ulyanov. Mm. Knew him well. Always sat between the window and economics, A to K, etc. Well, take away all that. And who was he to Radic, or Radic to him, or Martov, or Martinov, Plekhanov, or he to Yulianov, for that matter, in Zurich in 1917? Café conspirators. So what? Snowballs in hell. Snowballs at all, Lenin. He had only one chance in a million. Remember the time they had that meeting? Social Democrats for a Civil War in Europe. Total attendance, four. Yulianov, Mrs. Yulianov, Zinoviev, and a police spy. And now they want to know what he was like. What he was like, Lenin, I am often asked. To those of us who knew him, Lenin's greatness was never in doubt. <laughs> so why didn't you put a pound on him? You'd be a millionaire like that chap who bet sixpence against the Titanic. No, truth of the matter, Who'd have thought big oaks from a cornel room at number 14 Spiegelgasse? Now, now here's a thing. Mm. Two revolutions formed in the same street. Mm. Face to face in Spiegelgasse, street of revolution. A sketch. Met by the sadly sliding chagrined limit river, strike west. Well, and immediately we find ourselves soaking wet. Strike east, and immediately we find ourselves in the old town. Having left behind the banking, bouncing metropolis of trampolines and chronometry of all kinds, for here time has stopped in the riddled maze of alleyways and, <laughs> by the way, you'd never believe a Swiss red light district, pornographic fret workshops, mice stands. <laughs> oh, get a grip on yourself. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Second right, third left, Spiegelgasse. Narrow cobbled, high old houses in solid rank. Number 14, the house of the narrow cobbler himself, Kammerer, his name, Lenin, his peasant, tenant. And across the way at number one, the Mieri Bar, crucible of anti-art, cradle of Dada. Who? What? What's to say Dada? You remember Dada. Historical halfway house between Futurism and surrealism, twixt Martinetti and Andre Breton, tween the before the war to end all wars years and between the wars years. Dada, down with reason, logic, causality, coherence, tradition, proportion, sense, and consequence. My art belongs to Dada, cause Dada he treats me so well. Well then, memories of Dada by a consular friend of the famous in Old Zurich. A sketch. What did it do in the Great War, Dada, I am often asked. How did it begin? Where did it? When? What was it? Who named it? And why, Dada? These are just some of the questions that continue to baffle Dadaists the world over. To those of us who lived through it, Dada was, topographically speaking, the high point of Western European culture. Mm, I well remember it as though it were yesteryear. Oh, where are they now? Hugo Ball. Or was it Hans Arp? Yes, no. Picabia, was it? No. Zara, yes! Wrote his name in the snow with a walking stick and said, There, I think I'll call it the Alps. <laughs> Oh, the yes knows of yesteryear, whose only age done gone. Over the hills and far away, the six pounders pounding in howitzer land, no louder than the soft thud of snow falling off the roof. Oh, heaven, to be picked out, plucked out, blessed by the blood of a negligible wound and released into the folds of snow covered hills. Oh, Switzerland, unfurled like a white flag. Pacific civilian Switzerland, the miraculous neutrality of it, the non-combatant impartiality of it, the non-aggression packs of it, the international Red Cross of it, entente to the left, detente to the right, into the valley of the invalided, blundered and wandered myself when young. Car of the consulate. Mm. 
First name Henry, that much is in dispute, I mentioned in the books. For the rest, I'd be willing to enter a discussion, but not if you don't mind correspondence, into matters of detail and chronology. I stand open to correction at all points, except for my height, which can't be far off, and the success of my performance, which I remember clearly, in the demanding role of Ernest. Oh, no, oh, not Ernest, the other one. That, and the sense of sheer relief at arriving in a state of rest, namely Switzerland, the still center of the wheel of war. That's really the thing. The first thing to grasp about Switzerland is that there is no war here. Even when there is war in everywhere else, there is no war in Switzerland. Yes, sir. It is a complete absence of bellicosity, coupled with an ostentatious punctuality of public thoughts that gives the place its reassuring air of permanence. Switzerland, one instinctively feels, will not go away, nor will it turn into somewhere else. You have no doubt heard allusions to the beneficial quality of the Swiss air, Bennett. The quality referred to is permanence. Yes, sir. Desperate men who have heard the clock strike 13 in Alsace, in Trieste, in Serbia, and Montenegro, who have felt the ground shift beneath them in Estonia, Austro-Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire, arrive in Switzerland, and after a few deep breaths, find that the ringing and buzzing in their ears has regulated itself to a soothing tick-tock, and that the ground beneath their feet, while invariably sloping, is as steady as an app. Tonight, I incline to the theater. Get me out the straight cut trouser with the blue satin stripe and the silk cutaway. I'll wear the opal studs. Yes, sir. I have put the newspapers and telegrams on the sideboard, sir. Is there anything of interest? Uh, the new Zurcher Zeitung and the Zurcher Post announce, respectively, an important allied and German victory, each side gaining ground after inflicting heavy casualties on the other with little loss to itself. <laughs> yes, the war, poor devils. How I wish I could get back to the trenches, to my comrades in arms. The wonderful spirit out there in the mud and wire, the brave days and fearful nights. Bliss it was to see the dawn, to be alive was very heaven. Never in the whole history of human conflict was there anything to match the Carnage, God's blood, the shot and shell, graveyard, stench, Christ Jesu, deserted by simpletons, they damn us to hell, or a pronobus, quick, no, get me out. I think to match the carnation, ox blood, soft shilk cravat, starched, creased just so, asserted by a simple pin, the damask lapels, or no, brown, no, biscuit, no, get me out the straight cut trouser with the blue satin stripe and silk cutaway. I'll wear the opal studs. Yes, sir. I have put the newspaper and telegrams on the sideboard, sir. Is there anything of interest? The war continues to dominate the newspapers, sir. Ah, yes. The war, the war. I was in Savile Row when I heard the news, talking to the head cutter at Druid and Madge in a hound's tooth check slightly flared beneath the knee. Quite unusual. Old Druid or oh, Madge, came in and told me. Never trusted the Hun, I remarked. Bosh, he replied. And I, at the time unfamiliar with the appellation, turned on my heel and walked into Trimiton Punch, where I ordered a complete suit of Harris knickerbockers with hacking vents. By the time they were ready, I was in France. Great days. Dawn breaking over no man's land, dew drops glistening on the poppies in the early morning, all quiet on the western front, Tickety-boo, tickety-boo, tickety-boo. A gentleman called, sir. He, he did not wait. What did he want? He did not vouchsafe his business. He, sir, he left his card. Tristan Zara. Dada, dada, dada. Did he have a stutter? He spoke French with a Romanian accent and wore a monocle. <laughs> He is obviously trying to pass himself off as a spy. It is a form of vanity widely indulged in Zurich during the European War, I believe, and adds greatly to the inconveniences caused by the crowds of real spies who conspire to fill the Odeon and Terrasse and make it almost impossible to get a table at either. I have noticed him with a group of friends at the Terrasse, sir. Whether they were conspirators, I could not, of course, tell. Hmm. 
To masquerade as a conspirator, or at any rate, to speak French with a Romanian accent and wear a monocle, is at least as wicked as to be one. In fact, rather more wicked, since it gives a dishonest impression of perfidy, and moreover, makes the overcrowding in the cafes gratuitous, being the result neither of genuine intrigue nor of bona fide treachery. Was it not, after all, La Rochefoucauld and his maxims, who had it that in Zurich in spring, a war, in wartime, a gentleman is hard put to find a vacant seat for the spurious spies, peeping at police spies, spying on spies, I encounter spies. What a bloody country! Even the cheese has holes in it. R has, on the above words, done violence to the inside of a cheese sandwich. Yes, sir. I have put the newspaper and the telegrams on the sideboard, sir. Is there anything of interest? There's a rev revolution in Russia, sir. Really? What sort of revolution? A social revolution, sir. A social revolution? Unaccompanied women smoking at the opera, that sort of thing? Not precisely that, sir. It's more the nature of a revolution of classes contraposed by the fissiparious disequilibrium of Russian society. What do you mean, classes? Masters and servants, as it were, sir. Oh, masters and servants. Classes. There have been scenes of violence. I see. Well. I'm not in the least bit surprised, Bennett. I do not wish to appear wise after the event, but anyone with half an acquaintance with Russian society could see that the day was not far off before the exploited class, disillusioned by the neglect of its interests, alarmed by the falling value of the ruble, and above all goaded beyond endurance by the insolent rapacity of its servants, should turn upon those butlers, footmen, cooks, valets, Parenthetically, Bennett, I see from your book that on Thursday night when Mr. Zara was dining with me, eight bottles of champagne are entered as being consumed. I have had previous occasion to speak to you of the virtues of moderation, Bennett. This time, I will only say, remember Russia. Yes, sir. I have put the newspapers and telegrams on the sideboard, sir. Is there anything of interest? The Tsar has now abdicated, sir. There is a provisional government headed by Prince uh, Lvov with Guchkov as Minister of War, Milyokov, Foreign Minister, and the Socialist Kerensky as Minister of Justice. The inclusion of Kerensky is calculated to recommend the government to a broad base of the common people, but effective authority has already been challenged by a committee of workers' deputies, or Soviet which has for the moment united all shades of socialist opinion. However, there is no immediate prospect of the socialists seizing power, for the revolution is regarded by them as the fulfillment of Karl Marx's prophecy of a bourgeois capitalist era in Russia's progress towards socialism. According to Marx, there is no way for a country to leap from autocracy to socialism. While the ultimate triumph of socialism is inevitable, being the necessary end of the process of dialectic materialism, it must be preceded by a bourgeois capitalist stage of development. When the time is ripe, and not before that, there will be a further revolution led by the organized industrial workers or proletariat. Thus, it is the duty of Russian Marxists to welcome the present bourgeois revolution, even though it might take several generations to get through. As things stand, therefore, if one can be certain of anything, it is that Russia is set fair to become a parliamentary democracy on the British model. Newspapers or coded telegram? General rumor put about uh, Zurich by the crowds of spies, counter spies, radicals, artists, and riffraff of all kinds. Uh, Mr. Zara called, sir. He did not wait. I'm not sure that I approve of your taking up this modish novelty of free association, Bennett. I'm sorry, sir. It's only uh, that Mr. Zara being an artist... I will not have you passing moral judgments on my friends. If Mr. Zara is an artist, that is his misfortune. Yes, sir. I have put the newspapers and 
telegrams on the sideboards. So. Is there anything of interest? In St. Petersburg, the provisional government has now declared its intention to carry on the war. However, the Committee of Workers' Deputies, or Soviet, consider the war to be nothing more than an imperialist ad uh, adventure carried on at the expense of workers of both sides. To cooperate in this adventure, it is to be stigmatized in a novel phrase which seems to translate as Lixpital capitalist lackey. Unnecessarily offensive in my view. I'm not sure that I'm much interested in your views, Bennett. They are not particularly interesting, sir. However, there is a more extreme position put forward by the Bolshevik party. The Bolshevik line in is that some unspecified but unique property of the Russian situation, unforeseen by Marx, has caused uh, the bourgeois capitalist era of Russian history to be compressed into the last few days, and that the time for the proletarian revolution is now ripe. But the Bolsheviks are a small minority in the Soviet, and their leader, Vladimir Yulianov, also known as Lenin, has been in exile since the abortive 1905 revolution and is in fact living in Zurich. <laughs> Naturally. Yes, sir. If I may quote La, uh, La Roche Foucault, Quel pays sanguinaire, même le fromage est plein de trous. Lenin is desperately trying to return to Russia, but naturally the Allies will not allow him free passage. Since Lenin is almost alone in proclaiming the Bolshevik orthodoxy, which is indeed his creation, his views at present count for nothing in St. Petersburg. A betting man would lay odds of about a million to one against Lenin's view prevailing. However, it is suggested that you take all steps to ascertain his plan. I ascertain Lenin's plans. Telegram from the minister. A million to one. I'd put a pound on him, sir. You know him. I do, sir. And if any doubt remained, the British. Uh, Secret Service assures us that the man to watch is Karen Seki. Bennett seems to be showing alarming signs of irony. I have always found that irony among the lower orders is the first sign of an awakening social consciousness. It remains to be seen whether it will grow into armed seizure of the means of production, distribution, and exchange, or spend itself in liberal journalism. Mr. Sara. How are you, my dear Tristan? What brings you here? A pleasure, pleasure. What else? Eating as usual, I see, Henri? Hello, hello, what is all the teapot, etc. Somebody coming? It is Gwendolyn, I hope. I love her, Henry. I've come by a tram expressly to propose the marriage. Aha! Miss Gwendolyn and Mr. Joyce. Gwendolyn and James Joyce enter. Bennett remains by the door. Gwendolyn and Zara are momentarily transfixed by each other. This is hardly noticed as Joyce has made it his own entrance. Top of the morning, James Joyce. I hope you allow me to voice my regrets in advance for coming on the off chance. But Jesus, I hadn't much choice. I'm sorry, would you say that again? But God, I'd better explain. I'm told that, that you are a... Mr. Cesaro. Miss, Miss Carr. Miss Tazara. But Joyce's, Joyce is the name. I'm sorry, how terribly rude. Henri, Mr. Joyce. How'd you do? Delighted. Good day. I just wanted to say how sorry I am to intrude. Tell me, are you some kind of poet? You know my work? No, it's something about your delivery. Can't quite... Irish. From Limerick. No, Dublin. Don't tell me you know it. He's a poor writer. Aha, a fine writer who writes caviar for the general, hence poor. Wants to touch you for sure. I'm addressing my friend, Mr. Carr. Mr. Zara writes poetry and sculps. I'm quite unexpected results. I'm told he recites on Saturday nights, does all kinds of things for adults. I really don't think Mr. Carr is interested much in Dada. Uh, we say it like, Da, da. The fact is, I'm rather hard up. 
Yes, I'm told that you are. If it's money you want, I'm afraid. Oh, Henry, he's mounting a play. And Mr. Joyce thought, with your official support. Ah. And a couple of pounds till I'm paid. I don't see why not, for my part. HMG is considered pro-art. Consider me auntie. Consider your auntie. A pound would do for a start. The Bosch put on culture a plenty. For Swiss, what's the word? Cognoscenti. It's worth 50 tanks. Or 25 francs. Now, British culture. I'll take 20. Culture and reason. 15. They give us a mincing machine. That's awfully profound. Could you lend me a pound? All literature is obscene. The classics, tradition, vomit on it. Oh. Beethoven, Mozart, they spit on it. Oh. Everything's chance. Consider your aunts. Causality, logic, I shh. Awfully profound. Are you lending a pound? I thought he was going to say shit on it. By Jove, I've got it. Eolanthe. Obscene. Is it? Avanti. Guten tag, adios. Au revoir. Vamanos. Give my regards to your auntie. A Romanian rhymer I met used a system he based on roulette. His reliance on chance was a definite advance, and yet, and yet, and yet. An impromptu poet of Hibernia rhymed himself into a hernia. He became quite adept at the, practic at the practice except for occasional anticlimaxes. When I want to leave things in the air, I say, excuse me, I've got to repair to my book about bloom and just leave the room. Well, let us resume. Zurich, by one who was there. Mr. Zara. How are you, my dear Tristan? What brings you here? Oh, pleasure. Pleasure. What else should bring anyone anywhere? Eating and drinking as usual, I see, Henry. I've often observed that stoical principles are more easily borne by those with... Uh, Epicurean habits. I believe it is done to drink a glass of hock and seltzer before luncheon, and it is well done to drink it well before luncheon. I took to drinking hock and seltzer for my nerves at a time when nerves were fashionable in good society. This season it is trench foot, but I drink it none regardless because I feel much better after it. Well, you might have felt much better anyway. No, no. Post hock, proctor hock. But my dear Henry, causality is no longer fashionable owing to the war. Well, how illogical, since the war itself had causes. I forget what they were, but it was in all the papers at the time. Something about brave little Belgium, wasn't it? Was it? I thought it was Serbia. Brave little Serbia? Oh no, I don't think so. The newspapers would never have risked calling the British public to arms without proper regard for succinct alliteration. <laughs> what nonsense you talk. Well, it may be nonsense, but at least it is clever nonsense. I am sick of cleverness. In point of fact, everything is chance. Oh, that sounds awfully clever. What does it mean? It means, my dear Henry, that the causes we know everything about depend on causes we know very little about, which depend on causes we know absolutely nothing about. And it is the duty of the artist to jeer and howl and belch at the delusion that infinite generations of real effects can be inferred from the gross expression of apparent cause. It is the duty of the artist to beautify existence. Da 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 da
in the mud and blood of a foreign field unmatched by anything in the whole history of human carnage, ruined several pairs of trousers. Nobody who has not been in the trenches can have the faintest conception of the horror of it. I had hardly set foot in France before I sank up to the knees in a pair of twill jodhfers with pigskin straps hand-stitched by Ramage and Hawks. And so it went on. The 16-ounce surge, the heavy worsteds, the silk flannel mixture, until I was invalided out with a bullet through the calf of an irreplaceable lambswool dyed khaki in the yawn to my own specifications. I tell you, there is nothing in Switzerland to compare with it. Oh, come now, Henry, your trousers always look... I mean trench warfare. Well, I, I dare say, Henry, but you could have spent the time in Switzerland as an artist. <laughs> My dear Tristan, to be an artist at all is like living in Switzerland during a world war. To be an artist in Zurich <coughs> in 1917 <coughs> implies a degree of self-absorption that would have glazed over the eyes of Narcissus. When I sent round to Hamish and Rudge for their military pattern book, I was responding to my feelings of patriotism, duty, to my love of freedom, my hatred of tyranny, and my sense of oneness with the underdog. I mean, in general, I never particularly cared for Belgians as such. And besides, I couldn't be an artist anywhere. I can do none of the things by which is meant art. Do the things by which is meant art is no longer considered the proper concern of an artist. Uh, I think we have an unexpected guest. <laughs> What's uh, happening there? <laughs> in fact, it is frowned upon. Nowadays, an artist is someone who makes an art between the things he does. A man may be an artist by exhibiting his hindquarters. He may be a poet by drawing words out of a hat. But that is simply to change the meaning of the word art. I see I've made myself clear. Then, then you wow. are not actually. Uh, sorry, somebody needs to kick out Taylor and Morgan. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll get them. <laughs> okay. There we go. How are we doing? Where's the other one? Uh, we've got a couple of. Uh, yeah, I know. We're getting Zoom bombed here, so we'll turn them off. How about that? My asshole burns. Bro, 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 bro. Oh, man. Where's the other one? My asshole burns. Bro, 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 bro. Morgan. My asshole soup burns. Bro, bro, bro. My asshole. Okay, I think we're ready to resume. Cool. But that is simply to change the meaning of the word art. I see I've made myself clear. Then you are not actually an artist at all. On the contrary, I've just told you I am. But that does not make you an artist. An artist is someone who is gifted in some way that enables him to do something more or less well, which can only be done badly or not at all, by someone who is not thus gifted. If there is any point in using language at all, it is that the word is taken to stand for a particular fact or idea and not for other facts or ideas. I might be able to claim to fly. Lo, I say, I am flying. But you are not propelling yourself about when suspended in the air, someone may point out. Ah, no, I reply. That is no longer considered the proper concern of people who can fly. In fact, it is frowned upon. Nowadays, a flyer never leaves the ground and wouldn't know how. I see, says my somewhat baffled interlocutor. So when you can say you can fly, you are using the word in a purely private sense. I see I have made myself clear, I say. Then, says this chap in somewhat relief, you cannot actually fly after all. On the contrary, I say, I have just told you I can. 
Don't you see, my dear Tristan, you are simply asking me to accept that the word art means whatever you wish it to mean, but I do not accept it. Why not? You do exactly the same thing with words like patriotism, duty, love, freedom, king and country, brave little Belgium, saucy little Serbia. You are insulting my comrades at arms, many of whom died on the field of honor. And honor. All the traditional sophistries for waging wars of expansion and self-interest set to patriotic hymns, patriotic hymns, music is corrupted. Language conscripted. conscripted. Words are taken to stand for their opposite. That's why anti-art is the art of our time. The nerve of it. Wars are fought to make the world safe for artists. It's never quite put in those terms, but it's a useful way of grasping what civilized ideals are all about. The easiest way of knowing whether good is triumphed over evil is to examine the freedom of the artist, the ingratitude of artists, indeed their hostility, not to mention the loss of nerve and failure of talent which accounts for modern art, merely demonstrate the freedom of the artist to be ungrateful, hostile, self-centered, and talentless, for which freedom I went to war. Wars are fought for oil wells and coaling stations, for control of the Dardanelles or the Suez Canal, for colonial pickings to buy cheap in and uh, conquered markets to sell deer in. War is capitalism with the gloves off and many who go to war know it, but they go to war because they don't want to be a hero. It takes courage to sit down and be counted. But how much better to live bravely in Switzerland than to die cravenly in France, quite apart from what it does to one's trousers. Oh my God, you little Romanian wog, you bloody dago, you jumped up, phrase-making, smart alecky, arty intellectual Balkan turd. Think you know it all. While we poor dukes were fighting for ideals, you've got a profound understanding of what's really going on underneath. You've got a phrase for it, you pedant. Do you think your phrases are the sum truth of each man's living of the day? Capitalism with the gloves off? Do you think that's the true experience of a wire-cutting party caught in crossfire in no man's land? It's all the rage in Zurich, you slug. I'll tell you what's really going on. I went to war because it was my duty, because my country needed me, and that is patriotism. I went to war because I believe those boring little Belgians and incompetent frogs had the right to be defended from German militarism, and that's love of freedom. That's how things are underneath, and I won't be told by some yellow-bellied Bolshevik that I ended up in the trenches because there's a profit in ball bearings. Quite right. You ended up in the trenches because on the 28th of June, 1900, the heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary married beneath him and found that the wife he loved was never allowed to sit next to him on royal occasions, except when he was wearing, uh, when he was acting in his military capacity as inspector general of the Austro-Hungarian army, in which capacity he therefore decided to inspect the army in Bosnia so that at least on their wedding anniversary, the 28th of June, 1914, they might ride side by side in an open carriage through the streets of Sarajevo. Ah... Or to put it another way, we're here because we're here, because we're here, because we're here, we're here, because we're here, because we're here, because we're here. Great day. The dawn breaking over no man's land. Dew drops glistening on poppies in the early morning sun, the trenches stirring to life. Good morning, Corporal. All quiet on the Western Front. Tickety boo. So carry on. Wonderful spirit in the trenches. Never in the whole history of human conflict was there anything to match the courage, the comradeship, the warmth, the cold, the mud, the stench, fear, folly, Christ, Jesus, but for this blessed leg, I never thought to be picked out, plucked out, blessed by the blood of a blighty wound. Oh, heaven released into the folds of snow-white feathered beds, Pacific civilian heaven, the mystical swisticality of it, the entente cordiality of it, the Jesus Christ, I'm out of it, into the valley of the invalided car of the consulate. And what brings you here, my dear Tristan? Oh, pleasure. 
Pleasure. What else should bring anyone anywhere? Eating as usual, I see, Henry. I believe it is customary in good society to take a cucumber sandwich at five o'clock. Where have you been since last Thursday? In the public library. What on earth were you doing there? It's just what I kept asking myself. And what was the reply? Shh. Cecily does not approve of garrulity in the reference section. Ooh, who is Cecily? And is she as pretty and well-bred as she sounds? Cecily is a name well thought of at fashionable christenings. Cecily is a librarianess. I say, do you know someone called Joyce? Joyce is a name which could only expose a child to comment around the font. No, no. <laughs> uh, Mr. Joyce, Irish writer, mainly, mainly of limericks, uh, christened uh, James Augustine, though registered due to a clerical, er uh, clerical error as James Augusta, a little known fact. Well, certainly I did not know it. But then I've never taken an interest in Irish affairs. In fashionable society, it would be considered a sign of incipient vulgarity with radical undertones. Well, the war caught Joyce and his wife in Trist in uh, Austro-Hungary. They got into Switzerland and settled in Zurich. Uh, he lives in Universi Universitatis Strasse and is often seen round about in the library, in the cafes, wearing, for example, a black pinstripe jacket with gray herringbone trousers, a brown donegal jacket with a black pinstripe trousers, or a gray herringbone jacket with brown donegal trousers. All being the mismatched halves of sundry, sundry, sundered, sundry Sunday suits. Sorts language into hands of contract bridge. His limericks are said to be more interesting, though hardly likely to start a revolution. I say, do you know someone named Ulina? I'm finding this conversation extremely hard to follow, and you still have not told me what you were doing in the public library. I had no idea that poets nowadays were interested in literature. Or is it that your interest is in Cecily? Good heavens, no. Uh, Cecily is rather pretty and well-bred, as you surmise, uh, but her views on poetry are very old-fashioned, and her knowledge of the poets is, as indeed of everything else, is eccentric. Uh, being based on alphabetical precedents, she is working on her way to along the shelves. Uh, she has read Allingham, Annan, uh, Ar Arnold, Bellock, Blake, both Brownings, uh, Byron, and so on up to, I believe, G. Who is Allingham? Well, up the airy mountain, down the rushy glen, we daren't go a-hunting for fear of little men. Cicely would regard any poem that came out of a hat with the gravest suspicion. <laughs> Hello, why the extra cup? Why, why cucumber sandwiches? What's coming to tea? Who's, oh, who's coming to tea? It's merely set for Gwendolyn. She usually returns about this hour. Oh, perfectly delightful. And to be honest, not expected. Uh, I'm in love with Gwendolyn and have come expressly to propose to her. Well, that is a surprise. And surely not, Henry. I've made my feelings for Gwendolyn quite plain. Well, of course you have, dear fellow. But my surprise stems from the fact that you must surely have met Gwendolyn at the public library. For she has left here every morning this week, saying that that is where she is going. And Gwendolyn is a scrupulously truthful girl. In fact, as her elder brother, I have had to speak to her about it. Unrelieved truthfulness can give a young girl a reputation for insincerity. I have known plain girls with nothing to hide, captivate the London season purely by discriminate mendacity. Oh, I assure you Gwendolyn has been in the public library, uh, but I have had to admire her from afar, all the way from economics to foreign literature. I had no idea Gwendolyn knew any foreign languages, and I am not sure that I approve. It's the sort of thing that can only broaden a girl's mind. Well, in this library, foreign literature includes English. What a novel arrangement. Is any reason given? The point is, Henry, uh, I can't get to speak to her alone. <laughs> yes, her chaperone. Chaperone? Well, yes, you don't imagine that I'd let my sister go unchaperoned in a city largely frequented by foreigners. Gwendolyn has made a friend in Zurich. I have not met her. But Gwendolyn assures me that they are continuously in each other's company. And from a description which I have elicited by discreet questioning, she cannot be but a wholesome and restraining influence, being practically middle-aged, plainly dressed, bespectacled, and answering 
to the name of Joyce. Oh, good heavens. Is he after her money? Well, only in derisory installments. He claims to be writing a novel and has made a disciple out of Gwendolyn. She transcribes for him, looks things up in works of reference and so on. The poor girl is so innocent, she doesn't stop to wonder what possible book could be derived from reference to Homer's Odyssey in the Dublin Street Dictionary Directory for 1904. Homer's Odyssey and the Dublin Street Directory? Oh, for 1904. I admit it's an unusual combination of sources, but not wholly without possibilities. Anyway, there's no need to behave as though you were married to her already. You are not married to her already, and I don't think you ever will be. Why do you say that? Why on earth well, do you say that? In the first place, girls never marry Romanians. And in the second place, I don't give my consent. Your consent? My dear fellow, Gwendolyn is my sister. And before I allow you to marry her, you will have to clear up the whole question of Jack. Jack? What on earth do you mean? What, what do you mean, Henry, by Jack? I don't know anyone by the name of Jack. You left this here the last time you dined. You mean to say you've had my library ticket all this time? I had to pay a small fine in replacing it. Oh, that was extravagant of you. Since the ticket does not belong to you, it is made out in the name of Mr. Jack Zara. And your name isn't Jack, it's Tristan. No, it isn't, it's Jack. You have always told me it was Tristan. I've introduced you as everyone as Tristan. You answer to the name of Tristan. Your notoriety at the Myriad Bar is firmly associated with the name Tristan. It is perfectly absurd saying that your name is not Tristan. Well, my name is Tristan in the Myriad Bar and Jack in the library, and the ticket was issued in the library. To write, or at any rate to draw words out of a hat under one name and appear in a public library under another is an understandable precaution, but I cannot believe that is the whole explanation. My dear Henry, the explanation is perfectly simple. One day last year, not long after the triumph of the Mary Bar, our noise concert for Siren, uh, Rattle and Fire Extinguisher, a bunch of the boys were sinking a beer in the Cafe Zoom Adler. Myself, Hans R, Hugo Ball, Bacabia, Arp as usual was inserting a warm croissant into his nose. I was quietly imp improving a Shakespeare sonnet with a pair of scissors. Which one? Uh, I believe it was the 18th. The one beginning, Berglichen sole ich dich dem Sommertag, da du rit lieber licher, wit milder beast. Oh, but surely in German it's hardly worth the trouble. Oh, completely pointless. If it weren't, it wouldn't be Dada. Well, who should come in but Ullenauf, also known as Lenin? with a group of Zimmerwaldists. Well, that sounds like the last word in revolutionary socialism. It is. At Zimmerwald in 1915, we called on the workers of the world to oppose the war. We? Well, I, I dined with them, and in fact, was doing so on this occasion when someone at the bar piano started to play a Beethoven sonata. Lenin went completely to pieces, wept like a child. When he recovered, he dried his eyes and lashed onto the Dadoists lashed into the Dadas. Decadent nihilists flogging too good for them, and so on. Uh, fortunately, the name Sara meant nothing to him. Uh, but a few days later, I met him at the library, and he introduced me to Cecily. Sara, said she, not the Dadaist, I hope. I could feel Lenin's eyes upon me. My younger brother Tristan, I replied. Uh, most unfortunate, terrible blow to the family. When I filled up my application form, for some reason, the first name I thought of was Jack. It has really turned out rather well. Cecily knows Lenin, does she? Oh, yes. Uh, he's made quite a disciple out of Cecily. She's helping him with his book of imperialism. You, did you say the reference section? Well, they agree on everything, including art. As a Dadaist, I'm the natural enemy of bourgeois art and the natural ally of the political left. But the odd thing about revolution is that the further left you go politically, the more bourgeois they like their art. Well, there's nothing odd about that. Revolution in art is in no way connected with class revolution. Artists are members of a privileged class. Art is absurdly overrated by artists, which is understandable. But what is strange is that it is absurdly overrated by everyone else. 
Because man cannot live by bread alone. Yes, he can. It's art he can't live on. When I was at school on certain afternoons, we all had to do what was called labor. Weeding, sweeping, sawing logs for the boiler room, that kind of thing. But if you had a chick for matron, you were let off to spend the afternoon messing about in the art room. Labor or art. And you have a chit for life. Where did you get it? What is an artist? For every thousand people, there's 900 doing the work, 90 doing well, nine doing good, and one lucky bastard who's the artist. Yes, by Christ. And when you see the drawings he made on the walls of the cave and the fingernail patterns that he one day pressed into the clay of the cooking pot, then you say, my God, I am one of these people. It's not the hunters and the warriors that put you in the first rung of the ladder to consecutive thought and a rather unusual flair in your poncy trousers. Oh, yes, it was. The hunter decorated the pot. The warriors scrawled the antelope on the wall. The artist came home with the kill. All of a piece. The idea of an artist as a special kind of human being is art's greatest achievement, and it's a fake. My God, you bloody English Philistine. You ignorant, smart-ass, bogus, bourgeois, Anglo-Saxon prick. When the strongest began to fight for the tribe and the fastest to hunt, it was the artist who became the priest guardian of the magic that conjured the intelligence out of the appetites. Without him, man would be a coffee mill. Eat, grind, shit. Hunt, eat, find, grind. Fight, grind. Saw the logs, shit. The difference between being a man and being a coffee mill is art. That difference has become smaller and smaller and smaller. Art created patrons and was corrupted. It began to celebrate the ambitions and acquisitions of the paymaster. The art has negated him. The artist has negated himself. Paint, eat, sculpt, grind, write shit. Without art, man was a coffee mill, but with art, man is a coffee mill. That is the message of Dada. Dada, 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 Dada. Miss Gwendolyn and Mr. Joyce. Good morning. My name is James Joyce. James Augusta. Was that a shot in the dark? Oh, not at all. I'm a student of footnotes to expatriate Irish literature. Oh, you know my work? No, only your name. Mrs. Carr? Mr. Zara. But something about you suggests Limerick. Dublin, Dublin. Don't tell me you know it. Only from the guidebook, and I gather you are in the process of revising that. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. How terribly rude. Henry, Mr. Joyce. How do you do? Delight. Good day. I just wanted to say... Do you know Mr. Zara, the poet? By sight and reputation, but I'm a martyr to glaucoma and inflation. Recently, as I was walking down the Bahnhofstrasse, my eye was caught by a gallery showcase, and I was made almost insensible with pain. Mr. Joyce has written a poem about it. It is something you two have in common. Hardly. Mr. Tsara's disability is monocular and by rumor affected. Whereas I have certificates for conjunctivitis, iritis, and senecia, and I'm something of an international eyesore. I mean poetry. I was thinking of your poem, The Hannah Fostress, beginning, The eyes that mock me sign the way, where to I pass at eve of day. Grey way, whose violet signals are the trusting and twinning star. Uh, for your masterpiece, I have great exp expectorations. Oh! Uh, for you, I would evacuate a monument. Oh! Art for art's sake, I am likewise defecated. Dedicated. <laughs> I'm a foreigner. So am I. But it is the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. I have a good ear. Would you not agree, Mr. Zar? What is the most perfect thing about you, Miss Carr? No, oh, I hope not. That would leave no room for development. But have you not read any, Mr., any of Mr. Zara's poems? 
to my shame, I have not. But perhaps this, the shame is yours, Mr. Czar. I accept it, but the matter can be easily put right and at once. <laughs> Mr. Czar. And Wadara oh. retires to the sideboard or writing table and begins to write fluently on a large piece of white paper. And what about you, Doris? Joyce. Joyce. It is not as a poet that I come to see you, sir, but as the business manager of the English players, a theatrical troupe. The business manager? Yes. Well, if it's money you want, I'm afraid. Oh, Henry, he's mounting a play. And Mr. Joyce thought your official support. Well, well, perhaps I'd better explain. It seems, sir, that my name is in bad odor among the British community in Zurich. Whether it is my occasional contribution to the neutralist press, or whether it is my version of Mr. Dooley beginning, who is the man when all the gallant nations run to war? Goes home to have his dinner by the very first cable car, and as he eats his cantaloupe, contorts himself with mirth to read the blatant bulletins of the rulers of the earth. End ending. It's Mr. Dooley. Mr. Dooley, the wisest white our country ever knew. Poor Europe ambles like sheep to shambles, sighs Mr. Dooley. Ooly, ooly, ooly. Or some other cause altogether. The impression remains that I regard both sides, both sides, with equal indifference. And you don't? Only as an artist. As an artist, naturally I attach no importance to the swings and roundabout of political history. But I come here not as an artist, but as James A. Joyce. I'm an Irishman. The proudest boast of an Irishman is I paid back my way. So it is money. A couple of pounds would be welcome, certainly. But it is to repay a debt that I have come. Not long ago, after many years of self-reliance and hardship, during which my work had been neglected and reviled, even to the point of being burned by a, big, uh, by a bigoted Dublin printer, there being no other kind of printer av available in Dublin, I received 100 pounds from the civil list at the discretion of the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister? Mr. Asquith. I am perfectly well aware of who the Prime Minister is. I am the representative of His Majesty's government in Zurich. The, the Prime Minister is Mr. Lloyd George, but at that time it was Mr. Asquith. Oh, yes. I do not at this moment possess 100 pounds, nor was it the intention that I would repay the debt in kind. However, I mentioned the English players. By the fortune of war, Zurich has become the theatrical center of Europe. Here, culture is the continuation of war by other means. Italian opera against French painting, German music against Russian ballet, but nothing from England. Night after night, actors totter about the rake stage of this Alpine Renaissance, speaking in every tongue but one, the tongue of Shakespeare, of Sheridan, of Wilde. The English players intend to mount a repertoire of masterpieces that will show the Swiss who leads the world in dramatic art. Gilbert and Sullivan, by God! And also, Mr. Joyce's own play, Exiles, which so far, unfortunately... That's, that's quite by the way. Patience. Exactly. First things first. Trial by jury. Pirates of Penzance. We intend to begin with that quintessential English jewel, the importance of being earnest. I don't know it, but I've heard of it, and I don't like it. It is a play written by an Irish... Uh, Gomorrahist. Now, look here, Janice. I may as well tell you, His Majesty's government... I have come to ask you to play the leading role. What? We would be honored and grateful. Whoa, whoa. what on earth makes you think I am qualified to play the leading role in the importance of being earnest? It was my suggestion, Henry. You were a wonderful gone real at Eaton. Well, yes, I, I know, but... Uh... We are short of a good actor to play the lead. He's an articulate and witty English gentleman. Ernest. Not Ernest, the other one. Uh, no, 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 no. I, I, I absolutely... Aristocratic, romantic, epigrammatic. He's a young swell. A swell. He says thing like, things like, uh, I may occasionally be a little overdressed, but I make up for it by being immensely overeducated. 
That gives you the general idea of them. How many changes of costume? Two complete outfits. Town or country? First one, then the other. Indoors or out? Both. Summer or winter? Summer, but, but not too hot. Not raining? Not a cloud in the sky. But he could be wearing a uh, boater? It is expressly stipulated. And he's not in pajamas? Expressly prescribed. Or in mourning? Oh, not the other one. Ernest. Describe the play briefly, omitting all but essential detail. Act one. The curtain rises. A flat in Mayfair. Tea time. You enter in a bottle green velvet smoking jacket with black frogging, hose white, cravat perfect, boots elastic sided, trousers of your own choice. Act two. I shall have to make certain expenditures. A rose garden. After lunch, some byplay among the small parts. You enter in a debonair, debonair garden party outfit. Berry, berry boned boater, gaily striped blazer, party colored shoes, trousers of your own choice. Cream flannel. Act three, the morning room, a few moments later. Change of costume. Possibly by the alteration of a mere line or two of dialogue. You brought a copy of the play. I have it here. Then let us retire to the next room and peruse it. Uh, about, about the... Just two pounds. <laughs> My dear Phyllis. Gamora hissed. Silly bugger. Zara comes forward with rare diffidence, holding a hat like a brimming bowl. Miss Carr. Mr. Zara, you're not leaving. Well, not before I offer you my poem. <laughs> he offers the hat. Gwendolyn looks into it. Your technique is unusual. Well, all poetry is a reshuffling of a pack of picture cards, and all poets are cheats. I offer you a Shakespeare sonnet, but it is no longer his. It comes from the wellspring where my atoms are uniquely organized, and my signature is written in the hand of chance. Which sonnet was it? The 18th, in English. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. And summer's lease hath shall all too short a date. Sometimes too hot to the eye heaven shines. And often is his gold complexion dimmed. And every fair from fair sometimes declines. By chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Yes. That's the one. You tear him for his bad verses. She lets a handful of words fall from her fingers back into the hat. These are but wild and whirling words, my lord. Aye, madam. Truly, I wish the gods had me be poetical. I do not know what poetical is. It is... Is it honest in word and deed? Is that a true thing? Sure, he had made us with such large discourse. Looking before and after gave us not that capability and godlike reason to fuss as in his unused. I was not born under a rhyming planet. Those fellows of infinite tongue that can rhyme themselves into ladies' favors, they do reason themselves out again and that would set my teeth nothing on edge. Nothing so much as mincing poetry. Thy honesty and love doth mince this matter. Put your bondage for his right use, tis for the head. And I'd rather than fourteen shilling I had my book of songs and sonnets here. She is turned away. He approaches with his hat offered. But since he died, and poet better prove for his style you'll read, mine for my love. Oh, for Gwen a style read, mine for my love. Gwen hesitates, but then takes the first slip of paper out of the hat. Darling. She continues, 
holding on to all the pieces of paper she takes out. Shake thou thy gold buds, an untrimmed but short fair shade shines. Sees this lovely hot possession growest so long by nature's course. So long, heaven! She turns her back on the hat, taking a few steps away from Sara, who takes out the next few words, lowering the temperature. And declines, summer changing, more temperate complexion. Pray don't talk to me about the weather, Mr. Zara. Whenever people talk to me, though, about the weather, I always feel quite uncertain that they mean something else. What? I do you mean something else. Ever since I met you, I have admired you. He drops his few papers into the hat. She does likewise with hers. He puts the hat aside. For me, you have always had an irresistible fascination. Even before I met you and I was far from indifferent to you. As you know, I have been helping Mr. Joyce with his new book, which I am convinced is a work of genius. Alas, in fashionable society, genius is regarded as an affront to the ordinary decencies of family life. A girl has few opportunities to meet a man like yourself who shares her regard for Mr. Joyce as an artist. I, Gwendolyn? Did you think, my darling, that I had not noticed you at the library? How you gaze at him in admiration all the way from economics to foreign literature? When I elicited by discreet questioning that you, too, were a poet of the most up-to-date disposition, I knew I was destined to love you. Do you really love me, Gwendolyn? Passionately. Darling, you don't know how happy you've made me. My own Tristan. They embrace. But you don't mean that you couldn't love me if I didn't show your regard for Mr. Joyce as an artist. But you do. Yes, I, I know I, I do, but supposing... She kisses him on the mouth. They embrace. Rise, sir, from that semi-recumbent posture. Zara and Gwen spring apart. Joyce walks across to the main door, picking up his hat, opens the door, addresses Zara. Your monocle is in the wrong eye. Zara has indeed placed his monocle in the wrong eye. He replaces it. I must Joyce tell Henry. Left. Gwen gives Zara the folder she acquired in the prologue. Here is the chapter of Mr. Joyce's book, which I have been transcribing for him. But have you ever come across Dada, darling? Never, Dada, darling. The chapter we are doing next is cast in the form of the Christian catechism. Gwen kisses him and exits. Joyce re-enters, pausing in the threshold. He's covered from head to breast in little bits of white paper, each bit bearing one of the words of Shakespeare's 18th sonnet, i.e. Sara was using Joyce's hat. What is the meaning of this? It has no meaning. It is without meaning as nature is. It is Dada. Give further examples of Dada. Uh, the zoological gardens after closing time. The logical gardenia, the bankrupt gambler. The successful gambler. The egg board, a sport of pa or pastime for the top 10,000 in which the players, peppered from head to toe to foot in egg yolk, leave the field of play. Are you the inventor of this sport or pastime? I am not. What is the name of the inventor? Arp. By what familiarity, indicating possession and amicability, in equal parts, do you habitually refer to him? My friend, Arp. Alternating with what colloquialism redolent of virtue and longevity? Good old Arp. 
From whom did Arp receive encouragement and friendship? From Hugo Ball. Describe Ball by epithet. Unspherical, tall, thin, sacerdotal, German. Describe him by enumerations of his occupations and preoccupations. Novelist, journalist, philosopher, poet, artist, mystic, pacifist, founder of the Cabaret Voltaire at the Marier Bar, number one, Spiegelgasse. Did Ball keep a diary? He did. Was it published? It was. Is it in the public domain by virtue of the expiration of copyright protection as defined in the Berne Convention of 1886? It is not. Quote discriminately from Ball's diary in such a manner as to avoid forfeiting the goodwill of his executors. I went to the owner of the Murray Bar and said, I want to start a nightclub. That same evening, Zara gave a reading of poems, conservative in style, which he rather endearingly fished out of the various pockets of his coat. Is, is that the coat? It is. In what regard is a coat inferior and in what superior to a hat? insofar as they are interchangeable in the production of poetry. Inferior to a hat in regard to the tendency of one or both sleeves to hang down in front of the eyes, with the resultant possibility of the wearer falling off the edge of the platform. Superior to a hat in regard to the number of its pockets. Amplify discreetly from any contemporary diarist whose estate is not given to obsessive litigation over the trivial infringements of copyright. On February 26th, Richard Hulsenbeck arrived from Berlin, and on March 30th, Herr Tristan Sara was the initiator of a performance, the first in Zurich and in the world, of simultaneous, simultaneous verse, included a poem simultané sum, of his own composition. Quote severally your recollections of what was declaimed synchronously. I began, boom, 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 il déchabule, Sa chair, quand les grenouilles humides commenceront à brûler. Hulsenbeck, ahoy, ahoy, des erreurs, will bien qu'il est schnell, je le parte. John Cantor, I can hear the will, and at fuck when tea is set, I like everybody's doing it, doing it. The title of the post. Admirals. All this time, Joyce has bits of paper, hair, and from his clothes, replacing each bit in his hat, which is on his knees. Casually, he conjures from the hat a white carnation, apparently made from the bits of paper. He turns the hat up to show it is empty. He tosses the carnation at Zara. How would you describe this trial? As just and proper. Well merited. An example of enterprise and charm receiving their due. Joyce starts to pull silk hankies from the hat. What, reduced to their simple reciprocal form, were Sarah's thoughts about Ball's thoughts about Sarah, and Sarah's thoughts about Ball's thoughts about Sarah's thoughts about Ball? Well, he thought that he thought that he knew what he was thinking, whereas he knew that he knew that he knew that he did not. And did he? Well, he did and he didn't. What did data bring to pictorial art, sculpture, poetry, and music that had not been brought to these activities previously in... Uh, the appropriate flags start coming out of the hat. Barcelona, New York, Paris, Rome, and St. Petersburg, for example. Fakabia, Duchamp, Saiti, Marinetti, and Mayevskovsky, who shouts his fractured lines in a yellow blazer with blue roses painted on his cheeks. The word Dada. Describe sensibly, and without self-contradiction, and especially without reference to people stuffing bread rolls up the noses, how the word data was discovered. Tristan Zara discovered the word data by accident in a LaRousse dictionary. It has been said, and he does not deny, that a paper knife was inserted at random into the book. Olsen Beck recounts how he discovered the word one day at, in Hugo Ball's dictionary while Zara was not present. Hans Arp, however, stated, I hereby declare that Tristan Zara found the word Dada on February the 8th, 1916, at six o'clock in the afternoon. Were there further disagreements between Zara and Wilson Beck? There were. As to? 
as to the meaning and purpose of data. Hosenbeck demanding, for example? International revolutionary union of all artists in the basis of radical communism. As opposed to Zara's demanding? The right to urinate in different colors. Each person in different colors at different times or different people in each color all the time? Or everybody multicolored all the time? It was more to make the point that making poetry should be as natural as making water. God send you don't make them in one, in, God send you don't make one in the hat. By God, you supercilious streak of Irish puke. You four-eyed, bog-ignorant, potato-eating pots. Your art has failed. You've turned literature into an, a, a religion, and it's as dead as all the rest. It, it's an overripe corpse, and you're cutting fancy figures at the wake. It's too late for geniuses. Now we need vandals and desecrators, simple-minded demolition men to smash centuries of Baroque subtlety, to bring down the temple, and thus finally to reconcile the shame and necessity of being an artist. Dada. 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 We get in the stage direction or? Okay. I, I just did it, so. <laughs> <laughs> um. You are an overexcited little man with a need for self-expression far beyond the scope of your natural gifts. That is not discreditable. Neither does it make you an artist. An artist is the magician put among men to gratify capriciously their urge for immortality. The temples are built and brought down around him continuously and contiguously from Troy to the field of Flanders. If there is any meaning of any, in any of it, it is, what, it is in what survives as art. Yes, even in the celebration of tyrants. Yes, even in the celebration of non-entities. What now of the Trojan War if it had been passed over by the artist's touch? Dust. A forgotten expedition prompted by Greek merchants looking for new markets. A minor distribution, redistribution of broken pots. But it is we who stand enriched by a tale of heroes, of a golden apple, a wooden horse, a face that launched a thousand ships. And above all, of Ulysses, the wanderer, the most human, the most complete of all heroes, husband, father, son, lover, farmer, soldier, pacifist, and politician, inventor, and adventurer. It is a theme so overwhelming that I'm almost afraid to treat it. And yet I, with my doublet odyssey, will double that immortality. Yes, by God, there's a corpse that will dance for some time yet and leave the world precisely as it finds it. And if you hope to shame it into the grave with your fashionable magic, I would strongly advise you to try and acquire some genius and if possible some subtlety before the season is quite over. Top of the morning, Mr. Zara. With which Joyce produces a rabbit out of his hat, puts the hat on his head, and leaves, holding the rabbit. Really, if the lower orders don't set us a good example, what on earth is the use of them? They seem as a class to have absolutely no sense of moral responsibility. Zara has moved to Carr's door. He opens it and goes through. How are you, my dear Ernest? What brings you up to town? Pleasure, pleasure. Eating as usual, I see, algae. Algae. The other one. Personal triumph in the demanding role of Algernon Moncrief. Ah, the theaters are Kaufleuten on Pelikanstrasse, an evening in spring. The English players in that quintessential English jewel, the imprudence of being... Ah, now I've forgotten the first one. By Oscar Wilde, Henry Carr as Algy. Other parts played by Tristan Rawson, Cecil Palmer, Ethel Turner, Evelyn Cotton. Oh, forget the rest. Tickets, five francs, four bob a knob, and every seat filled. Must have made a packet for the Irish lout and his cronies. Still, not one to bear a grudge. Not after all these years and him dead in the cemetery up the hill. Unpleasant as it is to be dragged through the courts for a few francs after I paid for my trousers and filled every seat in the house. Not very pleasant to be handed 10 francs like a tip and then asking me for 25 francs for tickets. Bloody no. Here, here, I've got it. I've got it. <laughs> Zurich, 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 Zurich District Court. In the case of Dr. James Joyce, doctor my eye, plaintiff and counter defendant versus Henry Carr, defendant and counter plaintiff, with reference to the settlement of the following issues. A. Suit. 
Is defendant and counter plaintiff, that's me, obliged to pay the plaintiff and counter defendant, that's him, 25 francs? B, counter suit. Is plaintiff and counter defendant bound to pay defendant and counter plaintiff 300 francs? Have you got that? Joyce says, I owe him 25 francs for tickets. I say, Joyce owes me 300 francs for the trousers, etc., purchased by me for my performance as Henry. Or rather, God, the other one. Incidentally, you may or may or not have noticed that I got my wires crossed a bit here and there. You know how it is when the old think box gets stuck in a groove, and before you know it, where you are, you've jumped the points, and suddenly you think, no, steady on, old chap. That was Algernon. Algernon! There you are. All coming back now. I've got it straight. <laughs> I'll be all right from here on. In fact, anyone hanging on just for the cheap comedy of senile confusion might as well go, because now I'm on to how I met Lenin and could have changed the course of history, etc. What's this? Oh, yes. <coughs> Erkant has decided that one, de Becklachter, the defendant, Henry Carr, is obliged to pay Den Klager, the plaintiff, James Joyce, 25 francs. Ha! Ah, the counterclaim of Henry Carr is denied. Henry Carr to indemnify Dr. Joyce, 60 francs for trouble and expenses. In other words, a travesty of justice. Later, the other case came up. Oh, yes, he sued me for slander. Claimed I called him a swindler in a cab. <laughs> Thrown out of court, naturally. But it was the money with Joyce. Well, it was a long time ago. He left Zurich after the war, went to Paris, stayed 20 years, and turned up here again in December 1940. Another war. But he was a sick man then. Perforated ulcer. And in January, he was dead. Buried one cold, snowy day in the Flintern Cemetery up the hill. I dreamed about him. I dreamed I had him in the witness box. Masterly cross-examination. Case practically won. Admitted it all, the whole thing, the trousers, everything. And I flung at him. And what did you do in the Great War? I wrote Ulysses, he said. What did you do? Bloody nerve. And scene. Thank you very much. Uh, that is act one of Tom Stoppard's travest travesties. Um, there's a little uh, reaction button if you wanna clap and applaud. Um, I'm sure the performers would be uh, happy to see that on your responses. Uh, we're gonna take a quick intermission because that first act was an hour and just, yeah, uh, just over an hour and a half. So we're gonna come back at 9.15 and we'll do act two. And uh, if you want to chat mingle in the meantime, um, now would be a good time to turn on a video, talk to friends, people that you know, and uh, we'll chat for a bit, and then we'll come back to it in about 10 minutes. Thank you very much.
Carl, you were there and then you weren't. Nice to see you, but you're muted. No, not. Now you're not. Yeah. I was, uh, one of the actors was calling for the stage directions. I'm like, I read them. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was muted the whole time I was reading them. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. That's good to, yes, I got to hear this. So, so far, just long and long and long monologues and soliloquies and all that. Well, I mean, I was reading a Henry Carr's opening monologue. It's five pages. Mm -hmm. And his idea is that it should be done by an older actor. And I'm like, that's... That's not nice. That's just not a nice thing to do. So you ought to try doing Eugene O'Neill one, one of these times. Yeah. yeah. I, as I, had to, I had to do it way back 14 years ago uh, for Harry Ape. Uh, mine was about one and a half to two pages long. Yeah. Yep. Anyway, I'm just going to mute myself and get, uh, let everybody get back back onto the show. So. Yeah. Right. It's okay. okay. Um, Oliver, I believe... No, who's, I can't remember who's playing James. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, you're quite right. And we do have that setting that everybody's auto muted when they can't, when they can't come in. Uh, mm -hmm. We did have that set, but once people are in and they're admitted, then mm -hmm. they have the ability to turn themselves back on again, which is what was going on. So um, if there's a way that we could pre-clear an audience, maybe, but uh, we went with a public link. So mm -hmm. we took our Fair chances enough. and we got a little bird. We'll be okay. All right. All right. Fair enough. I, fair enough. I'll mute myself and then Tristan's tea time. 
All right. I think we're ready to get back. Uh, <laughs> I think we're ready to go back again with. Uh, here we go. Um, hang on a second. All right. Act two. Here we go. Okay. We are in the library. Lynette and his wife in Galatia in Austro-Hungary after a brief intermittent, they got to Switzerland and so settled in Bern. In 1916, needing a better library than the one in Bern, Lenin came to Zurich. Intending to stay two weeks, but he and Nadzeha liked it there and decided to stay. They rented a room in the house of a shoemaker named Kammerer at 14 Spilgasse. Zurich, during the war, was a magnet for refugees, exiles, spies, and anarchists, artists, and radicals of all kinds. Here could be seen James Joyce reshaping the novel into the permanent form of his own monument, the book the world now knows as Ulysses. And here too, the Dadaists were performing nightly at the Cabaret Voltaire at the Mererie Bar, a number one Spelgassi, led by a dark, boyish, and obscure Romanian poet. Joyce is seen passing among the bookshelves, also Carr now monocled and wearing a blazer, cream flannels, boater, and holding a large pair of scissors, which he snips speculatively as he passes between the bookcases. Joyce and Carr pass out of view. Every morning at nine o'clock when the library opened, Lenin would arrive. He would work till the lunch hour when the library closed and then return to, and work until six, except on Thursdays when we remained closed. He was working on a book on imperialism. On January 22nd, 1917, at the Zurich People's, at the Zurich People's House, Lenin told an audience of young people, we of the older generation may not live to see the decisive battles of the coming revolution. We all believed that that was so. But one day, hardly more than a month later, a Polish comrade, Bronski, ran into the Ulyanov house with the news that there was a revolution in Russia. Flotia. Bronski, Pejol. Oskar Zalstol, Verspilisberg, Revolutia. 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 <laughs> Sorry. Uh, a revolution? Napisano, Yes. <laughs> A toy. No. Have you? Da. Yes. It of the guts attack? Is that in newspapers? Da. It yum the moy on the dot. Yes, yes. Come on home. He's waiting. On Tom? Is he there? Yes. Because the talk on Nievo. He brought the paper? Da. Yes. To Sama Vidyala. You saw it yourself? Da, da, da. Yes, yes, yes. Idian is a disgazi, you must 
Chris Chasso, toca o seu biro, sabe de imagem. I'm so sorry, I lost my place. Give me a second. Uh, go home ahead of me. I will collect my papers and follow. Joyce? Hmm. Joyce, it's your line. Do we go, I'm sorry, do we go back to act two now? Like, yeah. Okay, sorry, the script is kind of weird, guys. Yeah, it um, is. Uh, okay. You can pick, you can pick it up on page, four, page 46. Got it. As Nadzehda writes in her memoirs of Lenin, from the moment the news of the February revolution came, Illich burned with eagerness to go to Russia. But this was easier said than done in this landlocked country. Russia was at war with Germany, and Lenin was no friend of the allied countries. His war policy made him a positive danger to them. Carr enters, very debonair in his boater and blazer, etc. Carr has come to the library as a spy, and his manner betrays this until Cecily addresses him. Indeed, it was clear that the British and the French would wish to prevent Lenin from leaving Switzerland and that they would have him watched. Oh. Cecily sees Carr, who hands her the visiting card he received from Bennett in Act One. Uh, tr it's Tristan, Sara, da 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 da. Why? It's Jack's younger brother. You must be Cecily. Shh. You are. And you, I see from your calling card, are Jack's descendant, nihilist younger brother. Oh, you mustn't really think I'm a decadent nihilist at all, or a descendant nihilist. Cecily, you mustn't think that I'm a decadent nihilist. If you are not, then, you have certainly been deceiving us all in a very inexcusable manner. To masquerade as a decadent nihilist, or at any rate, to ruminate in different colors and display the results in the Bahn Hof Trauss would be hypocritical. Oh, of, of course, I have been rather louche and devil take the hindmost. I'm glad to hear it. In fact, now that you mention the subject, I have made quite a corner in voluptuous disdain. I don't think you should be so proud of it, however pleasant it must be. You have been a great disappointment to your brother. Well, my brother has been a great disappointment to me and to Dada. His mother isn't exactly mad about him either. My brother Jack is a booby. And if you want to know why he is a booby, I will tell you why he is a booby. He has told me that you are rather pretty, whereas you are at a glance the prettiest girl in the whole world. Have you got any books here one can borrow? I don't think you ought to talk to me like that during library hours. However, as the reference section is about to close for lunch, I will overlook it. Intellectual curiosity is not so common that one can afford to discourage it. What kind of books were you wanting? Oh, any kind at all. Is there no limit to the scope of your interests? It is rather that I wish to increase it. An overly methodical education has left me to fend as best I can with some small knowledge of the aardvark, a master of the abacus, and a facility for abstract art. An aardvark, by the way, is a sort of African pig found mainly... In. I know too well what an aardvark is, Mr. Tsara. To be frank, you strike, you strike a sympathetic chord in me. Politically, I haven't really got beyond anarchism. I see. Your elder brother, meanwhile... Bolshevism. And you, I suppose? Zimmerwaldism. <gasps> oh, Cecily. Will you not make it your mission to reform me? We can begin over lunch. It will give me an appetite. Nothing gives me an appetite so much as renouncing my beliefs over a glass of hawk. I'm afraid I'm too busy to reform you today. I must spend the lunch hour preparing references for Lenin. Some faithful governess seeking fresh pastors. Far from it. I refer to Vladimir Ilich, who was my little help 
who, with my little help, is writing his book on imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. Oh, of course, Lenin. <laughs> but surely, now that the revolution has broken out in St. Petersburg, he will be anxious to return home. That is true. When the history of the revolution, or indeed of anything else, is written, Switzerland is unlikely to loom large on the story. However, all avenues are closed to him. He will have to travel in disguise with false papers. Oh, but I fear that I've said too much already. Vladimir is positive that there are agents watching him and trying to in ingratiate themselves with those who are close to him. The British are among the most determined, though, the least competent. Only yesterday, the ambassador received secret instructions to watch the ports. The ports. At the same time, the consul in Zurich has, has received a flurry of cryptic telegrams suggesting intense and dramatic activity. Knock him cold, drive him wild, break a leg, and one from the ambassador himself. Thinking of you tonight, Horace. Uh, I think I can throw some light on that. The consul has been busy for several weeks in rehearsals which culminated last evening in a performance at the Theater Zerkoflotten in Pelikanstrasse. Uh, I happen to be present. That would no doubt explain why he virtually left the consulate's affairs at the hand of his manservant, who fortunately has radical sympathies. Good heavens. You seem surprised. Well, not at all. I have a servant myself. I'm afraid I disprove of servants. You are quite right to do so. Most of them are without scruples. In the socialist future, no one will have any. So I believe. Uh, to whom did this manservant pass the consul's correspondence? Your brother, Jack. Oh dear, there I go again. You are not a bit like your brother. You are more English. I assure you I am as Bulgarian as he is. He's Romanian. They are the same place. Some people call it one, some the other. I didn't know that. Though... I always suspected it. Anyway, now that Ernest has opened, no doubt the consul will relieve his servant of diplomatic business. In all fairness, he did have a personal triumph in a most demanding role. Ernest? No, the other one. What do you mean by Ernest? The Importance of Being Ernest by Oscar Wilde. Wilde? You know him. No, in literature I'm only up to G. But I've heard of him, and I don't like him. The life is the art, as Vladimir Illich always says. Ars longa vita brevis, Cecily. Let us leave his proclivities in the decent obscurity of a learned tongue, Mr. Zara. I was referring to the fact that Oscar Wilde was a bourgeois individualist, and so I hear, overdressed from habit to boot. From habit to boot? And back again. Well, he may occasionally have been a little overdressed, but he made up for it by being immensely uncommitted. The sole duty and justification for art is social criticism. Well, that is a most interesting view of the sole duty and justification for art, Cecily, but it has a disadvantage that a great deal of what we call art has no such function, and yet in some way it gratifies a hunger that is common to princes and peasants. In an age when the difference between prince and peasant was thought to be in the stars, Mr. Zara, art was naturally an affirmation for the one and a consolation for the other. But we live in an age when the social order is seen to be the work of material forces, and we have been given an entirely new kind of responsibility, the responsibility of changing society. No, 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 my dear girl. Art doesn't change society. It is merely changed by it. Art is a critique of society, or it is nothing. Do you know Gilbert and Sullivan? I know Gilberton, but not Sullivan. Well, if you knew Ialanthi, like I know Ialanthi. I doubt it. Patience. How dare you? Pirates, pitiful. Control yourself. Radegar. This is a public library, Mr. Tsara. Gondoliers, madam. I don't think you ought to talk to me like that during library hours. However, as the reference se section is about to close for lunch, I will overlook it. Intellectual curiosity is not so common that one can afford to discourage it. What kind of books were you wanting? Any kind at all. You choose, I should like you, if you would, to make it your mission to reform me. We can begin over lunch. I'm afraid I'm too busy to reform you today. You will have to reform yourself. 
Here's an article which I have been translating for Vladimir Ilyich. You may not be aware, Mr. Tsara, that the governments of Western Europe today, there are 10 socialist ministers. I must admit my work has prevented me from taking an interest in European politics, but 10 is certainly impressive. It is scandalous. They are supporting an imperialist war. Meanwhile, the real struggle, the class war, is being undermined by these revisionists like Katsuki and MacDonald. Do you mean Ramsay MacDonald, Cecily? I don't mean Flora MacDonald, Mr. Zara. But he's an absolute Bolshie. He is working with the bourgeois capital, capitalist system and postponing its destruction. Karl Marx has shown that capitalism is digging its own grave. No, 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 my dear girl. Marx got it wrong. He got it wrong for good reasons, but he got it wrong just the same. By bad luck, he encountered the capitalist system at its most deceptive period. The Industrial Revolution had crowded the people into slums and enslaved them in factories, but had not yet begun to bring them the benefits of an industrialized society. Marx drew the lesson that the wealth of the capitalist had been stolen from the worker in the form of unpaid labor. He thought that was how the whole thing worked. That false premise was itself added to a false assumption. Marx assumed that the people would behave according to their class, but they didn't. In all kinds of ways and for all kinds of reasons, the classes move closer together instead of further apart. The critical moment never came. It receded. The tide must have turned at about the time when Das Kapital, after 18 years of hard labor, was finally coming off the press. A removing reminder, Cecily, of the folly of authorship. <gasps> How sweet you look suddenly, pink as a rose. That's because I'm about to puke into your Nancy straw hat, you prig, you swanking, catting fop, you bourgeois intellectual humbugger, you artist. Marx warned us against the liberals, the philanthropists, the piecemeal reformers. Change won't come from them, but from a head-on collision. That's how history works. When Lenin was 21, there was famine in Russia. The intellectuals organized relief soup kitchens, seed corn, all kinds of do-gooding with Tolstoy in the lead. Lenin did nothing. He understood that the famine was a force of the revolution. 21 years old in Samara in 1890 to 91. He was a boy and he understood that. So don't talk to me about superior morality, you patronizing can't struck prig. All the time you're talking about the classes, you're trying to imagine how I look stripped off to my knickers. Oh, that's a lie. But apparently it isn't. As Cecily continues to speak, we get a partial car's mind view of her. Colored lights begin to play over her body and most of the other light goes except for a bright spot on car. Faintly from 1974 comes the sound of a big band playing The Stripper. Car is in a trance, the music builds, and Cecily might perhaps climb onto her desk. The only way of the Marx and Lenin is the enemy of all revisionism, of opportunist liberal econo economism, of social chauvinist bourgeois individualism, quasi dadaist patronalism, pseudo Wildean aphorism, subjoicean catechism and dogmatism. Cubism, expressionism, rheumatism. Take him off! I don't think you ought to talk to me like that during library hours. However, as the reference section is about to close for lunch, I will overlook it. Intellectual curiosity is not so common that one can afford to discourage it. What kind of books were you wanting? Books? What books? What do you mean, Cecily, by books? I have read Mr. Lenin's article and I don't need to read any more. I have come to tell you that you seem to me the visible personification of absolute perfection. In body or mind? In every way. Oh, Tristan. You will love me back and tell me all your secrets, won't you? You silly boy, of course. I've waited for you for months. For months? Ever since Jack told me he had a younger brother who was a decadent nihilist, it has been my girlish dream to reform you and to love you. Oh, Cecily. Her embrace drags him down out of sight behind her desk. He resurfaces momentarily. But my dear Cecily, you don't mean to say that you couldn't love me if... And is dragged down again. 
Nadia enters wearing a bonnet, severely dressed, and carrying a book. From the moment news of the revolution came, Ilyich burnt with eagerness to go to Russia. He did not sleep, and at night all sorts of incredible plans were made. Lenin enters, wearing a clerical collar, but otherwise dressed in black from Parson's hat to Parson's leggings. He and Nadia look at each other and despair, chasuble and prism. Passports of a foreigner from a neutral country would have to be obtained. Dictating to Nadia. I mean, my video. <laughs> Letter to Yoko Genetsky, Stockholm, March 19, 1917. I cannot wait any longer. No legal means of threats to be. I cannot wait any longer. No legal means of transit available. Whatever happens, then your Viv and I must reach Russia. The only possible plan is as follows. You must find the two Swedes who resemble Zinyor Viv and me. But we cannot speak Swedish until they meet but till they must be deaf mutes. I enclose our photographs for this purpose. R, with his jacket off, surfaces from behind Cecily's desk. Two Swedish deaf mutes. The plan mentioned in this letter was not realized. Lennon produces a blonde wig from a cardboard box and puts the wig on his head. My dear Fyashalab, Alexievich, I am considering carefully and from every point of view that would be the best way of traveling to Russia. The following is absolutely secret. For emphasis, Lennon bangs his fist inadvertently on the bell on Cecily's desk. Cecily pops up and disappears again without being seen by Lennon. Please procure in your name papers for traveling to France and England. I will use these when passing through England and Holland to Russia. I can wear a wig. The passport photograph will be of me in a wig. I shall go to the burned consulate to present your papers and I shall be wearing the wig. Carr reappears again, fully dressed, and eavesdrops on the Lenins. You must disappear from Geneva for the last two or three weeks. You will receive a telegram from me in Scandinavia. Your Lenin. P.S. I write to you because I am convinced that everything between us will remain absolutely secret. Sarah enters briskly, unseen by Carr and not seeing him, and bangs the bell on Cecily's desk. Cecily pops up from behind the desk. Jack? Cecily! I have such a surprise for you. Your brother is here. <laughs> what nonsense, I haven't got a brother. He turns the other way and sees Carr. Oh my god. Brother Jack. The Lenins, the Lenins stop and stare at these events. Brother Jack, I have come to tell you that I'm sorry for all the embarrassment I have caused you in the past and that I hope very much that I do not have to embarrass you in the future. Jack, you are not going to refuse your own brother's hand? Nothing will induce me to take his hand. He knows perfectly well why. Jack, if you don't shake hands with your brother, I will never forgive you. Well, don't forgive me. Why should I care? The fact of the matter is, he is no more my... At this point, Lenin removes his wig and Zara recognizes him. Ah, comrade! Do you know my brother Tristan? Carr shakes hands heartily with the stunned Lenins. Carr holds his hand out to Zara. How do you do, comrade? Mrs. Comrade. Brother. This is the last time I shall ever do it. How pleasant it is to see so perfect a reconciliation. Let us leave the two brothers together. The plan mentioned in this letter was not realized. The Lenins gather their possessions and leave, Cecily going with them. She is a darling. I am in love with Cecily, which puts me in something of a moral dilemma. I must have a muffin to resolve it. You may have some tea cake. But I don't like tea cake. 
Besides, I have sworn never to shake hands with you again. Well, I don't want to shake hands. I don't want you to shake hands with me when I'm eating muffins. Muffins should never be eaten with shaking hands. Bennett enters with a muffin dish. Ah, Bennett, is there anything in my correspondence that I might share with you and Mr. Zaro? The odds on Lennon have shortened somewhat, sir, but you can still get a hundred to one against. A hundred to one? Put a tenor on for me, would you, Bennett? Running the show by Christmas. And a tenor for me, Bennett, the dustbin of history. Yes, sir. Bennett leaves. Carr and Sarah help themselves to the contents of the dish. I'm shocked, Henry. You're surely not going to let your so-called duties stand in the way of your love for Cecily Carruthers. I haven't decided. There are still several muffins left. He takes one. Nadia enters, dressed to travel, and lugging a suitcase and a bundle or two. The boundary between library and room is now perhaps obscure. On the same day, March 19th, there is a meeting of the Russian political immigrant groups in Switzerland to discuss ways and means of getting back to Russia. Martov suggested gaining permits to pass through Germany in exchange for German and Austrian prisoners of war interned in Russia. March 21st, letter to Kar Karpinski in Geneva. Martov's plan is good. Only we cannot deal directly with the German authorities. Therefore, Comrade Grimm, president of the Zimmerwald Committee, undertook the negotiations. March 25th, telegram from German High Command to the Foreign Minister in Berlin. No objection to the transit of Rus Russian revolutionaries if effected in special train with reliable escort. Look, be fair. I adore Cecily, but the Americans are about to enter the war, and it's not a good moment for some Bolshevik to pull the Russians out of it. It could turn the whole thing around. I mean, I am on the side of right. Remember plucky little Poland? No, not Poland, the other one. A, tax a tactics. No trust in and no support of the new government. Gerinsky especially suspect. Army of the po proletariat is the only guarantee. Telegraph this to St. Petersburg. Mind you, according to Marx, the dialectic of history will get you much the same place with or without Lenin. If Lenin did not exist, it would be unnecessary to invent him. Telegram to Genetsky in Stockholm. Twenty of us are leaving tomorrow. Furthermore, your Marxism is a sheer pretension. You are an amiable bourgeois with a chit for matron, and if the revolution came, you wouldn't know what hit you. You're nothing. You're an artist, and multicolored micturition is no trick to those boys. They'll have you pissing blood. Artists and intellectuals will be the conscience of the res revolution. It is perfectly heartless of you to eat all the muffins and leave me with tea cakes. On April 9th, at 2.30 in the afternoon, the travelers moved off from Pfarringer Hof restaurant in true Russian style, loaded with pillows, blankets, and a few personal belongings. Ilyich wore a bowler hat, <laughs> a heavy overcoat, and thick hobnailed soled boots that had been made for him by the cobbler camera at number 14 Spielesgasse. Telegram to his sister in St. Petersburg. Arriving Monday night, 11, Taprovada. Well, do what you will. To a Dadaist, history comes out of a hat, too. I don't think there'll be a place for Dada in communist society. That's what we have against this one. There's a place for us in it. The train left at 3.10, on time. Lennon and Nadia leave with their luggage, sound of train departing. Cecily appears, dressed for the station platform, and waves a red handkerchief at the departing train. No, it is perfectly clear in my mind. He must be stopped. The Russians have got a government of patriotic and moderate men. Prince Lvov is moderately conservative, Kerensky is moderately socialist, and Guchkov is a businessman. All in all, a promising foundation for a liberal democracy on the Western model and for a vigorous prosecution of war on the Eastern Front, followed by a rapid expansion of trade. I shall telegraph the minister at Bern. Car leaves. Lenin is the only person on stage. Really? 
Really? The lower orders don't set us a good example. What on earth is the use of them? They seem as a class to have absolutely no sense of moral responsibility. To lose one revolution is unfortunate. To lose two would look like garrisonness. Old car re-enters, interrupting, consulting a tattered book. No, 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 steady on. Sorry, did you notice? Of course you did. Hello, hello, you thought he's doing it again. Right, well, never mind, here's the picture. April 16th, Lenin in St. Petersburg, yours truly holding the bag. I got pretty close to him, had a stroke of luck with a certain little lady, and I got a pretty good idea of his intentions. In fact, I might have stopped the whole Bolshevik thing in the tracks, but here's the point. I was torn. On the one hand, the future of the civilized world. On the other, my feelings for Cecily. And don't forget, he wasn't Lenin then. I mean, who was he, as it were? There I was, the lives of millions of people hanging on which way I'd move or, or whether I'd move at all. Another man might have cracked. Sorry about the muffin business, incidentally. Be that as it may, where were we? Ah, uh, yes, oh, okay. Lenin- Car opens his book, searching in it. Carr remains on stage with the book. Lenin makes a fresh start. Today, literature must become party literature. Down with nonpartisan literature. Down with literary supermen. Liter literature must become a part of the common cause of the proletariat, a cog in the social democratic mechanism. Publishing and distribu distributing centers, bookshops and reading rooms, libraries and similar establishes, establishments must all be under party control. We want to establish and we shall establish which are free press, free from careerism, and what is more, free from bourgeois and orchestral individualism. Nadia enters with a copy of the same book. Iliad wrote those remarks in 1905 during the First Revolution. Everyone is free to write, write, and say whatever he likes without any restrictions. But every volunteer voluntary association including the party is also free to expel members who use the name of the party to advocate anti-party views secondly we must say to you bourgeois individualists that you should talk about as absolute freedom is sheer hypocrisy there could be no real and effective freedom in a society based on the power of money socialist literature and art would be free because of the idea of socialism and sympathy with the working people instead of greed and careerism will bring ever new force to its ranks. The light goes out on Lenin. And a lot more like that. But there's somewhere about Bosch and nonsense. Hang on. Iliot wrote very little about art and literature generally, but he enjoyed it. We sometimes went to concerts and the theater, even musicals. He laughed a lot at the clowns, and he was moved to tears when he saw La Dame aux Camellias in London in 1907. Oh, La Dame aux Camellias. Illich admired Tolstoy, especially War and Peace. But as he put it in an article in 1908 on Tolstoy's 80th birthday, Lenin enters. I just lost my place, I'm sorry. On the one hand, we have the great artist. On the other hand, we have the landlord obsessed with Christ. On the one hand, the strong and sincere protester against social injustice. And on the other hand, the jaded histor hysterical sniveller known as a Russian intellectual beating his breast in public and wailing. I am a bad, wicked man, but I am practicing moral self-perfection. I don't eat meat, and now eat rice cutlets. Tolstoy reflected the stand-up hatred and the readiness for a new future, and at the same time the immature dreaming and political flabbiness, which was one of the main causes of the failure of the 1905 revolution. Here we are. However, he respected Tolstoy's traditional values. The new art seemed somehow alien and incomprehensible to him. Clara Zetkin, in her memoirs, remembers her bursting out. 
Bosh and, and nonsense. We are good revolutionaries, but we seem to be somehow obliged to keep up with modern art. Well, as for me, I'm a barbarian. Expression Futurism. Futurism. Cubism. I don't understand them. them. And I, I get, get no, no pleasure from them. from them. That's my point. There was nothing wrong with Lenin except his politics. <laughs> September 15th, 1919. 2 a.m. 2 a.m. Gorky, dear Alexei Maxi. <laughs> I stop doing a voice. I recall a remark of yours during our talks in London, on Capri, and later, namely, we artists are irresponsible people. Exactly. exactly. You utter incredibly angry words. But what? About a few dozen, or perhaps even a few hundred, cadet and near cadet gentry. Spending a few days in jail in order to prevent plots which threaten the lives of tens of thousands of workers and peasants. A calamity indeed. What an injustice. A few days, but even weeks, in jail for intellectuals in order to prevent the massacre of tens of thousands of workers and peasants. Artists are irresponsible people. In other words, a chit from Matron. Both on Capri and afterwards, I told you. You allow yourself to be surrounded by the worst elements of bourgeois into intelligence yeah and to come to the whining no really you will go under if you don't tear yourself away from these bourgeois intellectuals with all my heart i wish that you would do this quickly all the best yours lenin yes for you are not writing anything once in 1919 we went to a concert in the kremlin and an actor started declaiming something by mayakovsky Mayakovsky was celebrated even before the revolution when he used to shout his fractured lines in a yellow blazer with blue roses painted on his cheeks. Ilyich was in the front row and he nearly jumped out of his skin. Memo to Evi Leninjarsky, Commissar for Education. Aren't you ashamed for printing 5,000 copies of Mayakovsky's new book? It is nonsense. Stup Stupidity. Double-dyed stupidity and affectation. Mayakovsky should be whipped for his futurism. Mayakovsky shot himself in 1930. Zara got fat, died in Paris in 1963. With modern art, you see, you have to pick your time and place. I remember when we were in London in 1903, how E.H. longed to go to the Moscow theater to see the lower depths. We did so after the revolution. Well, the overacting irritated him. After seeing the lower depths, he avoided the theater for a long time. But once we went to see Uncle Vanya, which he liked very much. And finally, the last time we went to the theater in 1922, we saw a stage version of Charles Dickens' Cricket on the Hearth. After the first act, Ilyich found it dull. The saccharine sentimentality got on his nerves, and during the conversation between the old toy maker and his blind daughter, he could stand it no longer, and we left. Yes, I would have enjoyed a crack with old Vladimir Ilyich, talking about art and literature in the cafes, strolling along the Bahnhofstrasse, discussing Tolstoy and Dostoy, yeah, the other one. It wasn't the same with Zara and Joyce. Never hit it off with them. Never saw eye to eye, but Lenin and I. Oh, if only I'd known. But he had a train to catch, and then it was too late. Pity. But I remember him one evening at a friend's house in Moscow, listening to a Beethoven sonata. I don't know of anything greater than the Amon Apasinata. So human music. It always, makes, it always makes me feel, perhaps naively, it makes me feel proud of the miracles that human beings can perform. But I can't listen to music often. It affects my nerves. 
makes people want to say nice, stupid things in the back of the head of people who are living in this vile hell can create such beauty. Nowadays, we can't pet heads or we'll get our hats beat off. We've got to hit heads and them without mercy. Though I deal with against doing violence to people. Car leaves the room. Lennon leaves the library. The music continues. Once, when Vladimir was in prison in St. Petersburg, he wrote to me and asked that at a certain time of day, I would go and stand on a particular square of pavement on the Spalnier. When the prisoners were taken out for exercise, it was possible through one of the windows in the corridor to catch a momentary glimpse of this spot. I went for several days and stood a long while on the pavement there, but he never saw me. Something went wrong. I forget what. Good morning, Mr. Gallagher. Good morning, Mr. Sheehan. There is something that is troubling me that is very plainly seen. Mr. Gallagher, I'm a peaceful man. I never yell or shout. Mr. Sheehan, when if you will come by with me, I'll try and help you out. Oh, Mr. Gallagher. Yes, hello. Mr. Gallagher. Ms. Carruthers. Cecily Carruthers. Cecily Carruthers. What a pretty name. According to the council, round the fashionable fonts, you'll often hear the Cecilies declaimed. Oh, dear Miss Carr. Oh, dear Miss Carr. Pleasure, remain exactly where you are. I beg you, don't get up. I think we'll need another cup. Pray sit down, Miss Carruthers. So kind of you, Miss Carr. Miss Carruthers, oh, Miss Carruthers, I hope that you will call me Gwendolyn. I feel I've known you long, and I'm never ever wrong. Something tells me that we're going to be great friends. Oh, Gwendolyn. Oh, Gwendolyn. It sounds as pretty as a mandolin. I hope that you'll feel free to call me Cecily. Of course, it's absolutely Cecily. Then that's settled, Gwendolyn. Oh, Gwendolyn. Oh, Gwendolyn. I fear you don't remember where we met. I'm not so picturesque when I sit behind a desk. Of course, my dear. How could I forget? Oh, Cecily, oh, Cecily, accept my sincere apology. Now, to be absolutely frank, is there trouble at the bank? At the library, Gwendolyn. At the library, Cecily. Oh, Gwendolyn. Oh, Gwendolyn, I dread to state the reason for my call. In fact, there is a fee due on Homer's Odyssey and the Irish Times for June 1904. <laughs> oh, Cecily, oh, Cecily, a friend of mine is writing Ulysses. I'm sure he never knew that the books were overdue. Since October, Gwendolyn. On my ticket, Cecily. And it enters with a cup. There's a certain amount of tea pouring and tea sipping, not to mention the cup suddenly clinked down on the saucer. Oh, Cecily, oh, Cecily, aren't you the girl who has that Russian friend? I pass him every day by economics A to K. It's never going to be the same again. Oh, Gwendolyn, oh, Gwendolyn, he left this afternoon on the 310, I've just come from the train, but we'll hear of him again. Absolutely, Cecily. Positively, Gwendolyn. Oh, Gwendolyn, oh, Gwendolyn, the library's going to seem so sad. Apart from Mr. Tsara, all the Bolsheviki are aboard that special choo-choo bound for Petrograd. <laughs> Excuse me, Cecily, dear. Cecily. Mr. Zara. Does he spell it with a T? T-Z-A-R-A? -A? 
a Bolshevik, you say? Absolutely, Gwendolyn. You surprise me, Cecily. Oh, Cecily. Oh, Cecily. I must admit, you've taken me aback. I shall certainly insist a tete a tete with Tristan. With Tristan? No, I mean his brother, Jack. Oh, Gwendolyn. Oh, Gwendolyn. Tristan's quite another thing again. Brother Jack is news to me. They kept it in the family. <laughs> Relatively, Cecily. Eminently, Gwendolyn. Oh, Gwendolyn. Oh, Gwendolyn, I'd like you to be the first to know Tristan's hanging up his hat for the proletariat. We have an understanding. Just a mo moment, Cecily. Dear Cecily, Tristan's understanding is with me. What he writes or draws is no concern of yours. Relatively, Gwendolyn. Absolutely, Cecily. Oh, Cecily. Oh, Cecily. You have made an unfortunate mistake. Forgive me if I say, Tristan mentioned yesterday, he dedicates his art for his own sake. Oh, Gwendolyn. Oh, Gwendolyn, clearly he has changed his mind since then. Today he said, my heart's no longer in the arts, expect accepting Cecily as a means toward an end. Oh, Cecily, oh, Cecily. To say this gives me physical distress, but one of Joyce's chapters sent Tristan into raptures on the subject of the stream of consciousness. Oh, Gwendolyn. Oh, Gwendolyn. It harrows me to contradict a friend, but his consciousness of class is the one that's going to last. Lower middle, Cecily. Are you really, Gwendolyn? Miss Carruthers? Yes, Miss Carr. I do not wish to trespass on your time. I hope that I will see you at the library, should you ever get around to pay your fine, Miss Carr. Miss Carruthers, is it done to wish you luck with all the others? I'm not awfully au fait with your manners down your way. And up yours, Miss Carr. Tristan! That's my brother. Your brother? Yes, my brother, Henry Carr. Do you mean he's not Tristan Sara, the artist? Quite the contrary. He is the British consul. Carr has frozen like a hunting dog. He's holding the folder given to him by Cecily in the library. Bennett opens the door. Mr. Zara. Tristan enters. Bennett retires. Zara carries his folder. Tristan, my Tristan. Comrade Jack? Comrade Jack. Yes, the gentleman who has his arm round your waist is a luminary of the Zimmerwald left. Are they Bolsheviks? Well, they dine with us. A gross disdain, Cecily. My sweet they are wronged making Gwendolyn. There is just one question I should like to ask, Mr. Carr. An admirable idea. Mr. Zara, there is a question I should like to put to you. What indeed did you think of the chapter I showed you? And what indeed do you think of the chapter I showed you? Very well written, interesting style. Very uh, well read. Rich, rich material. But as a social critique. But as art for art's sake. Rubbish! He's a madman. Bilge, it's unreadable. Oh, hypocrites. Hypocrites. I'm sorry, it was for love. For, for love? love? <laughs> that is true. Yes, it is. But... but our, Our intellectual, intellectual differences, differences are insuperable barriers.
The door closes behind them. Carr and Sara sink into the two main chairs. By the way, I hear that Bennett has been showing you my private correspondence. Bennett enters with champagne for two on a tray. He begins to dispense it. He has radical sympathies. There is no one so radical as a manservant whose freedom of the champagne bin has been interfered with. So I believe. Well, I've put a stop to it. Given him notice? Given him more champagne. We Romanians have much to learn from the English. I expect you'll be missing Sophia. You mean Gwendolyn? Oh, Bucharest. Oh, yes, the place of the Balk, the Paris of the Balkans. Silly place to put it, really. Is this the Perrier Jouet Brut 89? No, sir. All gone? I'm afraid so, sir. <sighs> Very well, Bennett. I have put the newspapers and telegrams on the sideboard, sir. Anything of interest? The new Zuricker Zutung and the Zuricker Post announce, respectively, the cultural high and low point of the theatrical season at the Theater Zurikofluten yesterday evening. Zuitung singles you out for a personal triumph in a demanding role. The minister telegraphs his congratulations and also thanks you for your telegram to him. He urges you to prevent Mr. Ulyanov leaving Switzerland at all costs. Bennett leaves. Pause. Irish lout. Russian. No, no. What's his name? Deirdre. Bridget. Joyce. 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 Lout. Quadrioculate Irish git. Came around to the dressing room and handed me ten francs. Like a tip. Bloody nerve. Sponger. Mr. Joyce. Um, where, where, where is your sister? Her money is in trust. I have only one request to make of you. And I have only one request to make of you. Why, for God's sake, can you contrive just once to wear the jacket that is suggested by your trousers? It is indeed the case that Joyce is now wearing the other halves of the outfit he wore in Act One. If I could do it once, I could do it every time. My wardrobe got out of step in Trieste, and its reciprocal members passed each other endlessly in the night. Now, could you let me have the 25 francs? What 25 francs? You were given eight tickets to sell at five francs per ticket. My books indicate that only 15 francs has been received from you. I have spent 350 francs of my own money so that your off the peg production should boast one character who looks as if he was acquainted with a tailor. If you hope to get a further 25 francs out of me, you will have to drag me through the courts. You are a swindler and a cat. Furthermore, your book has much in common with your dress. As an arrangement of words, it is graceless without being random. As a narrative, it lacks charm or even vulgarity. As an experience, it is like sharing a cell with a fanatic in search of a mania. Who, who gave you this manuscript to read? I did. Miss Carr, did I or did I not give you to type a chapter in which Mr. Bloom's adventures correspond to the Homeric episode of The Oxen of the Sun? Yes, you did. And it was wonderful. Then why do you return to me an ill-tempered thesis purporting to prove, among other things, that Ramsay MacDonald is in a bourgeoisie lickspittle, gentleman's gentleman? Ah. Oh. Oops. Ah. Miss Carr, where is the missing chapter? Excuse me, did you say Bloom? I did. And is it a chapter inordinate in length and erratic in style, remotely connected with midwifery? It is a chapter by which a miracle of compression, by which using a miracle of compression uses the gamut of English literature from Chaucer to Carlyle to describe events taking place in a lying in hospital in Dublin. It is obviously the same work. 
Gwen and Cecily swap folders with cries of recognition. Tsar, Kara, and Sara close in, a rapid but formal climax with appropriate cries of Cecily, Gwendolyn, Henry, Tristan, and appropriate Cecily. embraces. Tristan. Oh. There is music appropriate to the period. A formal, short dance sequence. Sara dances with Gwen, Carr with Cecily, Joyce and Bennett dance independently. The effect is, of course, a complete dislocation of the play. Carr and Cecily dance out of view. The others continue, and then they too dance off stage, just as old Carr dances back on stage with old Cecily. No, 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 no. It's pathetic, though. There was a court case, I admit, and your trousers came into it, I don't deny. But you never got close to that Vladimir Illich, and I don't remember the other one. I do remember Joyce. Yes, you are quite right. He, he was Irish with the glasses, but that was the year after 1918, and the train had long gone from the station. I waved a red hanky and cried, long live the revolution, as the carriage took him away in his bowler hat. And yes, I said yes when you asked me, but he was the leader of millions by the time you did your Algernon. Algernon, that was him. I said that was the year after. After what? You never even saw Lenin. Yes, I did. Saw him in the cafes. I knew them all, part of the job. And you were never the consul? Never said I was. Yes, you did. <sighs> Shall we have a cup of tea? The consul was Percy somebody. Bennett. What? I said the consul's name was Bennett. Oh, yes, Bennett. That's another thing. Are we going to have a cup of tea or not? And I never helped him write imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. That was the year before, too, 1916. Oh, Cecily, I wish I'd known then what you'd turn out to be a pedant. Wasn't this, didn't do that, 1916, 1917, what of it? I was there. Here, they were here, they went on, I went on. We all went on. No, we didn't. We stayed. Sophia married the artist. I married you. You played Algernon, and they all went on. <clears throat> Great days. Zurich during the war. Refugees, spies, exiles, painters, poets, writers, radicals of all kinds. I knew them all. Used to argue far into the night at the Odeon, the Terrasse. I learned three things in Zurich during the war. I wrote them down. Firstly, you're either a revolutionary or you're not. And if you're not, you might as well be an artist as anything else. Secondly, if you can't be an artist, you might as well be a revolutionary. Ah, I forget the third thing. And curtain. I'd like to invite all the players back. Yeah. Thunderous applause. Well done. Well, thank you, Ken. Well done. Cheers. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Uh, were everybody still sporting their um, their uh, character names? But uh, perhaps you could just give us your. Uh, real name and take a bow. And you're wondering where to start. Uh, we'll start with James Joyce because he's upper left in my corner. Um, I am, my real name is Dustin Freeman. Um, thank you for coming out. Bennett. Uh, I am Marcel Perro. Uh, thank you for coming out. I have to take my dog away now. <laughs> Walk your dog, thank you. <laughs> Gwendolyn. Uh, my name is Jacina Chaffins. I'm from Winnipeg, Manitoba, and thank you to everybody for having me. Tristan. Hey, um, uh, Oliver Giorgio, and uh, yeah, uh, I, had, I had fun. Thanks, Teach. And Nadia. Hello, I'm Sam Webster. I wanted to say spasivo for coming and listening and enjoying this play with us. Lenin. You're a little quiet. Oh, I am. There we are. There you go. Yeah. Thanks for watching. Have a good night, everyone. Cecily.
No, you're muted. Hi, my name is Emily Grant. Um, I had a great time. Thanks for having me, and I hope you all enjoyed it. Yes. And uh, I think last but not least is uh, Mr. Henry Carr. Yeah, but I've got no video because you stopped me. <laughs> I have the power to stop you. Yes, I did stop you. Hang on. Uh, I'll manage my participants and bring you back. Uh, just a moment. I'm so sorry, DJ. I was wondering, like, where's DJ? Like, <laughs> like he did this thing. Where is he? There we are. There Mr. we are. Carr. Hey, it's me, DJ Dayton. This doesn't come off. It looked like I was going to take this off. I mean, I could, but not easily. Uh, yeah, and thank you. Thank you, everyone who watched. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, everyone who participated. This has been a dream come true. And uh, I'm going to edit it down for, for Zoom, or sorry, for, for YouTube, and put it onto YouTube um, eventually, because, you know, me and computers, it'll be a little while. Uh, thanks. This was, like, so much fun. I love you all. I would love to hug you all, but we'd all die of COVID. Well, not from me, but it's whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to hold mine in reserve. That's a rain check hug. And I guess that's it. Do we bow? Should we try and bow? Pass yeah. bow? Like try and hold yeah, hands like in <laughs> each of the frames. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody figures that out, let me know. Because there's a lot of other groups that want to. <laughs> Yay.